Good afternoon and welcome to our October 12th Board of Education Business Meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are joining us here today and watching this meeting via live stream. Now let us begin the meeting by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will now call the roll to recognize board members and establish that we have a quorum. I begin with Mr. Saeed. Hello, everyone. Sammy Saeed, student member of the board. Very excited to be here today. Good afternoon, everyone. Lynn Harris, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Good afternoon, Rebecca Smondrowski, District 2. Good afternoon, Shepard Evans, representing District 4. Good to see everyone. Good afternoon, Brenda Wolf, District 5. Good afternoon, <laughs> Buenas tardes, Grace Rivera Oven, District 1. Good afternoon, everyone. Julie Yang, District 3. Now we can begin the meeting with the approval of the agenda. Of approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Okay. So now we will move on to our agenda item number three, human resources and development. Uh, Dr. McKnight. Yes, I move forward the monthly human, and resource, human resources and development report for approval. Of approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Um, I do have two resolutions that I will share with you today. The death on August 14th, 2023 of Mr. Carol J. Alexander, social studies teacher at Lakelands Park Middle School, deeply has saddened the staff, students, and members of the Board of Education. During the 10 plus years Mr. Alexander worked for MCPS, he strived to maintain a safe and welcoming classroom environment in which students felt comfortable and enthusiastic about learning. Mr. Alexander made it a priority to connect with his students. He made sure that all of his students felt safe and valued. He regularly checked on each student's progress and level of comprehension and provided additional instructional support as needed. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools express our sorrow at the death of Mr. Alexander and extend deepest sympathy to his family. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you. The death on August 14th, 2023, of Ms. Susan J. Loftus, physical education teacher at Burning Tree Elementary School has sat in the staff, students, and members of the Board of Education. During the 25 plus years Ms. Loftus worked for MCPS, she skillfully framed the learning for her students by using a variety of explanatory devices to create engaging lessons with GEM centers. She was committed to promoting positive interpersonal relationships with and among her students. Ms. Loftus understood her students' needs and assessed their progress by analyzing and providing regular instructional support. She knew her students well, accurately assessed their <laughs> level of understanding, and provided them with more instruction, demonstration, and practice time to ensure they were challenged appropriately. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools express our sorrow at the death of Ms. Loftus and extend deepest sympathy to her family. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Forward. Yes, moving on with agenda item number four, recognitions. Thank you. We do have one recognition today, and that's recognition of National School Bus Safety Week. The week of October 16th through the 20th has been designated as National School Bus Safety Week. School bus transportation is more than a ride to and from school. It is access to an education and a future filled with options for students. The school's bus experience is considered to be the student's first classroom, a place where students form relationships with peers and staff. School buses are widely recognized as the safest form of ground transportation. 
Each student riding a school bus should have a safe and secure environment that sets a positive tone for the day to foster a high level of learning and success. Staff in the Department of Transportation is committed to moving our future and will work collaboratively with our multi-agency partners to keep students safe as they travel to and from school. MCPS needs community members to serve students by stepping up to be the next great Montgomery County Public Schools bus operator, helping ensure transportation keeps safety at the forefront and maintains peak performance. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education proclaims the week of October 16th through the 20th, 2023, as National School Bus Safety Week. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Um, I will now um, take some time to address our staff and parent community, our MCPS community. Uh, this has been a difficult time for our staff and our school system as we grapple with the multiple lapses in judgment surrounding the complaint and promotion process in NCPS. The board wants staff to know that we are reforming and rebuilding the infrastructure, infrastructure of both processes. Speaking now directly to our staff, we are deeply sorry that a process intended to provide employees with a way to have their complaints redressed failed to ensure that all complaints were fully investigated and resolved. We will rebuild trust by ensuring that there is a robust system for managing and investigating complaints put into place and that there is an infrastructure within the Office of Human Resources and Development needed to support an organization with over 25,000 employees. The board is responsible for approving appointments to leadership positions, and we take that responsibility very seriously. It is evident the that the appointments process did not work. We are addressing this by enhancing our oversight processes for the selection and promotion of administrative staff so that we can ensure that the candidates coming before the board for appointments have been fully vetted. We have always asked questions about credentials and about making good matches with communities. And we relied on the administration to fully vet any candidate, candidate recommended to the board for approval. Going forward, we will have greater oversight of the totality of the process for board appointees. To our staff, students, and community, the board wants to reassure you that the email communications sent to the Board of Education are not deleted. We retain these emails and they can be accessed. Although there is a general one-year one retention policy in MCPS for emails, that does not apply to emails sent to the board. We are bound by the Maryland Public Information Act, which while being a law intended to ensure public access to documents, explicitly accepts personnel records. That we will comply with what is expected of us under this law is a given. But we also have heard from our staff and our community that access to a copy of the Jackson Lewis report outlining the facts surrounding the promotion and the appointment of Dr. Joel Beidelman is essential in restoring trust in our school system. We have tried to balance these interests, and today, after this statement from the board, we, we will release a redacted report that complies with the Maryland Public Information Act. We believe that restoring trust with our staff and our community is of utmost importance. And it is our hope that by releasing this document, which is redacted to protect the rights of our employees, we will be a step closer to a renewed belief in the integrity of our public school system. How we respond to what has happened will be an ongoing conversation. The board understands that one act cannot instantly repair the trust that was breached but it is our hope that we can walk down this journey of recovery and restoration together in partnership. We cannot and will not lose sight of our core mission, 
educating our over 162,000 students. Upon conclusion of the statement from the board, the redacted fact-finding report will be posted on the Board of Education website. Thank you, and we will now be moving on to item number five, which is public comments. Uh, Dr. McNett will speak after public comments. That was her wish. Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not our, the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for all complaints. This is a public meeting and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, or other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Those who demonstrate disruptive or disrespectful behavior during public comments may be asked to leave the room. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. We have 14 people signed up to provide in-person testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. When your name is called, please approach the table, speak clearly and directly into the microphone. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on, accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same button once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have three people signed up to provide video testimony. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on board docs where they are posted with the other materials for the meeting. Uh, we will have our uh, first three speakers please come forward. And let me pull up the revised agenda here. Mackenzie Smallwood, Ananya Mamboudri, and Betsy Perry. Please come to the table. Kenzie, you can begin. Good afternoon, members of the board. Just push your microphone right below, the light below. The, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Mackenzie Smallwood. I'm a sophomore at Northwest High School and a policy deputy at EcoMoco, a student-led advocacy program focused on saving the environment. Today, I'm testifying for school recycling. The process of recycling includes turning trash into usable products. According to the county's website, numerous, numerous measures have been taken to ensure that our county is recycling friendly. Every school must have, a, have at least three different types of bins, one for garbage, one for cans and bottles, and one for paper. There are only garbage cans and paper bins in classroom while hallways and outdoor spaces include bins for all three. Cafeterias only have trash cans and bottle containers. The lack of all three bins in numerous schools throughout the county limits the students' ability to recycle effectively. In addition to Montgomery County School, other counties are implementing more recycling regulations. The Howard County Public Schools website states that a single stream recycling should be available in every school in this county instead of dividing recyclables into different bins, as MCPS does. Single stream recycling places all recyclables into one bin. Frederick County Public Schools also has been promoting recycling. The recyclable, which they hold between schools, gives children a more competitive incentive to recycle and raises recycling rates in their county. Even if recycling initiatives run by MCPS are, are effective, there is still so much that can be done to make sure the county is more environmentally friendly. Our county should make sure that recycling is a priority again because our recycling rates have been declining. 
To ensure that all mandatory enforcement pr and programs are carried out, the schools must be held accountable. Included in this are the bin rules, which ensure that appropriate amount of bins are placed all around the school in each building. The county also must create a larger budget for recycling so that they may sponsor recycling initiatives and provide instruction on the subject. MCPS must of 30 seconds. Okay. MCBS must work with educators and administrators to come up with engaging and initiative strategies for teaching students the value of recycling Thank and you. conservation. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Annika Nambuthiri, and I'm a sophomore at Northwest High School, and I'm also a policy deputy for EcoMoco, a st student advocacy group focused on saving the natural environment. I'm advocating about the effects of excess light and light pollution on the environment. Light pollution is caused by excessive artificial light like car lights, street lamps, office buildings, and more. Although the primary concern of light pollution is the inability to see celestial objects like stars in highly polluted areas, there are many more effects. An abundance of nighttime light consumption can confuse natural rhythms and cause interruptions in natural sleep schedules. Nocturnal light also prevents the production of melatonin in many animals and organisms, which is created when there is a limited light in the environment. For animals and humans exposed to too much overnight light, melatonin levels can decrease, leading to stress, fatigue, anxiety, and in some cases, a higher risk of cancer. Light pollution is measured in magnitude per arc second squared, and Montgomery County is one of the most polluted areas in Maryland. However, light pollution is easily reversible. LED lights are more environmentally favorable than most other lights, which is why several studies, cities, including Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, are converting most of their street lights into LED lights. In the task force to study lightning efficiency and light pollution in Maryland, many steps are outlined to decrease the light pollution in our state, including using lamps that distribute the light only where is needed. However, MCPS can do more to help the problem. In most MCPS schools, lights are left running in unoccupied rooms for long periods of time. Because of this overuse of lights, over one third of school building electricity comes from lighting. And most MCPS schools should use more of the uh, na abundant natural light available in buildings. This excess nighttime light can harm the surrounding environment and organisms, worsening their natural sleep rhythms and melatonin production. Turning off these lights or installing motion sensor lights for nighttime can significantly decrease the light pollution around these schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Betsy Perry. I'm a special education teacher at Harmony Hills Elementary School. Dr. McKnight knows that my retirement date is December 1 of this year. I'm coming to you today on behalf of the Merrill, um, Montgomery County Education Association to speak on the struggles that special educators are dealing with on a daily basis, um, serving our students who require special services. Um, I'm also a national board uh, certified teacher. Um, I have almost 30 years experience and I am one of the reps for the Councils on Teaching and Learning, and also um, uh, a team leader at my school. Um, in my roles, I receive feedback about issues that our students are currently facing in the county. I also attended the Special Education MCPS Town Hall last week, which was uh, eye-opening that was open to all special education stakeholders. The majority of comments were highly concerning around special education teachers being burned out with large caseloads, short staffing, and not enough supports and resources to adequately serve our students. There are discrete trial self-contained classrooms where there are multiple grades at a time, there are lack of pairs, lack of staff, teachers um, working between multiple classrooms, not getting their lunch breaks, not getting the required planning time that they need, and able to perform duties that interfere with them being able to teach, plan with their colleagues, and support students. There are not enough teacher and paraeducator staff to meet IEP requirements. Staff are burning out at a safe, and safety is a growing issue. This is not sustainable. I am hearing that MCPS is considering considering hiring subcontractors to do this work, and that is not the answer. Many subcontractors do not meet the standards that MCPS sets forth for applicants to meet. What's more, subcontracting will be more expensive than directly hiring educators and paraeducators and providing incentives for those of us who have the experience um, for special ed. This is not sustainable. We implore you to please consider other options to support our most valuable students. I'm going to put my cape back on and go back to work. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. 
Our next three speakers, please come forward, Christine Handy, Deborah Monk, and Michelle Joseph. Dr. Handy, you may begin. I submitted my, my testimony for National Principals Month, and I urge you to read it. Thank you to our principals who work diligently to positively impact the success of our students, staff, and communities every day and deserve recognition. There's a lot going on in our district right now, so today, instead of reading what I previously submitted, I'm compelled to emphasize the urgency of a matter of great concern, the way forward for MCPS. Clarity is, a param is paramount in an organization with over 25,000 employees and more than 160,000 students. We need clarity in our vision, our expectations, communication, and collaboration to ensure that our leaders understand how to navigate the path ahead. As we look forward, I'm asking Dr. McKnight and the Board of Education to consider four critical action steps that merit immediate consideration. First, let's focus on our upcoming ANS meeting. The theme, Planning for Progress, should be transformed into a discussion on clarity of how we move MCPS forward together. It is imperative that we engage in a two-way dialogue to ensure a crystal clear understanding of how to translate the vision of this district into action. Second, we acknowledge the Inspector General's ongoing investigations. Uh, we must proactively address the issues at hand. To rebuild trust and work collaboratively with associations, I propose the creation of a task force comprising seven to eight members from each association. This task force can discuss and make recommendations on the investigative process to prioritize staff and student safety. Their input should be shared with you so that we're already equipped with valuable recommendations to consider when the IG investigation concludes. Third, I've been informed by our leaders that morale is low, but don't take my word for it. I recommend collecting data from the CAP to obtain genuine understanding of this. The results will provide authentic feedback. Following this, engage with our leaders in, in the listen to lead forums that you will be having, Dr. McKnight. This process will engage, enable you to connect with the workforce authentic voice. Fourth, I just want us to reaffirm our commitment to teaching and learning, the very essence of MCPS. We need an unparalleled focus. Thank you. Deborah Monk. Good afternoon, board members and Dr. McKnight and executive staff. I'm Deborah Monk. I'm president of the Montgomery County Public School Retirees Association. And um, we have two items related to retiree health insurance plans that I'd like to share with you. The first item addresses some differences between the plans offered to employees uh, uh, compared to what is offered to uh, retirees. The second item, which because of time limit, we'll bring to you at a future meeting, um, it regards the amount of the amount retirees pay for health care and how the costs are determined and managed in comparison with active employees. Our organization in cooperation with Erski did a thorough analysis of both retiree and active employee benefits. I sent a report to you um, with my comments. And we were surprised to note a number of discrepancies. However, there were two glaring differences for which our members are deeply distressed. The exclusions of hearing aids for members not yet eligible for Medicare and dental implants, as well as um, for, as well as dental implants. We understand that when a member becomes Medicare eligible, MCPS insurance becomes the supplementary coverage. Medicare does not cover hearing aids, so it's understandable that MCPS coverage would follow suit. But many of our members retire before the age of 65 and re rely solely on their MCPS medical insurance. We ask that MCPS cover hearing aids for this subset of retirees, just as it does for active employees. And now with regard to dental implants, the dental insurance covers up to $2,000 in costs per year. This includes checkups, cleanings, etc. However, only active employees are eligible for 50% coverage for implants. We are asking that MCPS allow retirees to apply implant costs against their $2,000 maximum. So in summary, on behalf of 2,200 members of MCPSRA, I ask that you provide uh, equitable benefits to retirees. Thank you. Michelle Joseph. 
Ms. Sylvester, Ms. Evans, members of the Board of Education, and Dr. McKnight. I come before you today as a mother of an MCPS student, a daughter of an MCPS teacher, a board member of Nonprofit Montgomery, and the owner of two businesses in Montgomery County. I applaud the county's procurement office for tracking the number of minorities, females, and disabled owned businesses in the county. We track that which we choose to measure and measure that which we choose to change. However, I was alarmed by the current report of minority and disabled owned businesses that were not awarded contracts with MCPS. Unfortunately, the fiscal year 2024 aggregate M FD contract award from the Division of Procurement stated that zero dollars were awarded to African American, Asian American, Hispanic, Latino businesses. However, other Maryland counties in total were awarded 3.2, excuse me, 3 million and 3 million, uh, can't do this now, 3 million and 25, uh, 800, 3 million 25,835 to uh, to African American, Asian American, and Hispanic Latino businesses. I understand that the Department of Procurement continues to focus on increasing MFD business participation in the awards of contracts for goods and services as part of the strategic plan. However, to date, it's not working. I recommend and suggest that novel ways to connect and communicate with minority and disabled owned businesses be addressed. Placing an ad in a minority business newspaper or a publication often is not sufficient. I suggest that the Department of Procurement ask minority and disabled owned businesses seeking to work with MCPS how to communicate with them, meet with them, and also where to address their issues and concerns and meet with them where they are. Although much has been done, more needs to be done. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. If we could get the first, uh, the next three speakers to please come to the table. Daniel Wubiset, Marty Gray, and Kirabel Fresenbet. <laughs> I ask all our, our uh, folks testifying to please stick to the two minute time slot. I do not like to cut people off. Danielle, you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. I'm an Ethiopian American lawyer, resident of Montgomery County and uh, father of two sons. My pronouns are he, him and his. I'm a cisgender straight man and a very strong ally of the LGBTQ community. I'm a member of the Coalition for Inclusive Schools and Communities. I come here before you again to uh, discuss your most favorite uh, topic, continuing emphasis on the benefits of inclusive and affirming uh, curriculums for all, especially for non-LGBTQ students. Reflecting on my own upbringing, I think of how fortunate my children and their friends are to live in a diverse and welcoming community like ours. They have the emotional intelligence and empathy not to be bigoted and intolerant of LGBTQ individuals. This is not achieved easily or by accident. Inclusive schools and curriculum promote these values. The new generation, including our Ethiopian American kids who are beneficiaries of such inclusive education, promote equality, inclusiveness, and become ambassadors fighting intolerance in their communities, whether here in Montgomery County or in their ancestral homelands. As an aside, I have added excerpts from, um, from recent UN and uh, US State Department human rights reports depicting the situation of LGBT folks in Ethiopia. I leave you to that. Our children are not chattel. They are not our property. They are entitled to develop their own thoughts, perspectives, and relationships. Let's make sure they have the knowledge, information, and tools to do so. Let's break the intergenerational succession of intolerance and ignorance. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Marty Gray, you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Marty Gray. I retired from MCPS in June 2019 after 15 years of service. 
I currently serve on the board of directors of the Montgomery County Public Schools Retirees Association. Deborah Monk, president, and I are here today representing over 2,200 members who gave so much to the children of Montgomery County during their careers in MCPS. MCPSRA is a vibrant, active organization that supports retirees with information and advocates on their behalf. An example is the recent work that was done to remove the fingerprint barrier to retirees volunteering. Prior to August 2023, retirees were required to be fingerprinted at a personal cost of $65, even though as an active employee, they had already been fingerprinted. An issue that has been a recurring concern among our members has been the disparity between retiree and active employee benefits. Thus, as a member of the Board of Directors of MCPSRA, I participated in a committee that analyzed this disparity in and issued the report that is attached to Deborah Monk's testimony. The report sets forth the committee's findings relative to member cost of health benefits, differences between benefits provided by MCPS to active and retired staff, and suggested recommendations recommendations to resolve major disparities. I would like to share with you my personal experience. Prior to retiring, I attended the retiree seminar, which focused on the paperwork necessary to retire. And boy, were there a lot of forms to complete. At the time, there was no explanation of the difference in benefits between active and retirees. I was not told that my health coverage would not include hearing aids or dental implants. However, I was told that I would be paying a higher percentage of the benefit premiums. Additionally, I later realized that as a retiree, I would no longer have the option of basic life insurance for my spouse. Unfortunately, my experience is not unique. Most retirees are not aware of this dis disparity or that they are paying more for benefits but receiving less. Thank you for your time. Thank you. May I begin? Good afternoon, board members. I'm here again to ask you to embrace common sense. I'm here to ask you to stop using public schools to indoctrinate gender and other political agendas. Schools are supposed to be places where kids learn useful skills, not a place for the world with all its diverse agenda fight its unfinished war in their mind. Dr. McKnight, are you aware that the process of selecting anti-racist community advisory group for you is hidden from the community? Or are we not part of the community? Isn't this board championing inclusivity? It's surreal that this is happening in the United States. The last place I expect to see this failed state style bureaucratic system is here in Maryland, United States. Why are we being discriminated to the point that we are excluded from even an advisory committee. This type of conduct is a path that caused failure of civilizations throughout history. My fellow Ethiopian lawyer, community member, thank you for agreeing that our children are not cattle. This is a real progress. They are not our physical properties, but they are our children, which we, are, we parents have fundamental rights to direct the care upbringing and education they receive. Look it up. It's in the Supreme Court ruling. It's a law. Thank you. Our next three speakers, please come forward. Dagmawi Laku, Emmett Tesler, and Burhani Teklamaiku. <clears throat> time and time again, so many of us come before you to ask for our basic right to opt out of indoctrination of our children. How many times or how many people will it take for you to hear us? The idea that we are threatened by the existence of the LGBTQ community is a huge lie and misleading. I don't hate anyone, nor am I threatened nor am I a bigot. That is exactly what I teach my children. Today, I want to reassure you that you have awakened thousands of families to the reality that we cannot trust you to do your job. We now understand how involved we have to be. This school board isn't on the side of parents. You have clearly shown us that we don't matter. If we mattered, 
the day you saw thousands of immigrants right outside this building from all different religions and backgrounds, that should have been your wake-up call, especially in deep blue Montgomery County, Maryland. But since you choose to ignore us, we promise to work as hard as it takes to register people to vote and to also get people to vote. This board doesn't care about equality or inclusion. We also understand this is happening across the country. So you can count on us to hold you accountable when the time comes. Our voices may not mean much to you here and now, but I promise you it will make a difference in the voting booth. We are not going away. We will not stop fighting for our God-given parental rights. Lastly, I want to say may God continue to bless and protect this great nation. Thank you. Thank you. Emmett Tesler, you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Emmett Tesler. My pronouns are he, him, and they. I am a fourth-year educator in Montgomery County. I have worked the Innovative School Calendar pro Program my entire teaching career, 2019 to present. I would like to return to the ELL sale program at Roscoe next. I think we need to return to this model because it aligns with the traditional calendar. On the MCPS evaluation summary report on page six, it states, multiple offices across the system found it difficult to incorporate the calendar dates for the Innovative Schools into their process and procedures designed for traditional school years. I have experienced this firsthand. I could not attend my school's pre-service my first year because my background check had not been cleared. I had to set up my classroom in 90 degree heat because AC was not working during several days of one of our only possible pre-service days before the start of the school year in July. Only one person working for MCPS could help fix it and they could not make it until Thursday. My own experience with the office, families also struggle to keep track of the separate calendar that has had a huge impact on attendance at Nick's. It's a significant issue. Our families take vacations and have summer plans like everyone else. They often vet travel outside of the country to visit families, and that takes up significant time. One student of mine was at Nick's Olive Kindergarten. At the start of the innovative school calendar, my student was not present. Synergy automatically withdrew the child, removing the student from my classroom. When the traditional calendar started, my student's family realized they had to re-enroll, and the child, again, she had missed, this child had missed over a month of first grade, but MCPS systems would not know. And now I have to work to try to catch this child up. And she is not alone. We get a huge influx of new students at the traditional, at the traditional, at the start of the traditional calendar that impacts, that leaves these students at least a month behind in instruction. I encourage you please to go back to the ELO sale program so we can reteach, review, and provide extension without causing confusion. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Great things to everyone. Dr. Mark Knight and board members, thank you for giving me a chance to express my and my family's concern. I left my home country because of a bad administration and government that forces people to do something they don't want to do and denied our rights that is given by our God. One God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Now once again, you denied our rights you are forcing children and families to do something they don't want to do. You have denied even the small privilege of opt-out. We families trust in you and send our children to school to give them a knowledge and skills so that they, be, they benefit something good to themselves and families and to the country, not learning sexualizing agenda and fantasy. Please focus on education. Please focus on what children need not what the LGBTQ community wants to be. And one thing you need to know, our culture based on our religion. Our religion is following the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ. Six years ago, after I granted asylum, I have been sent to learn English and American culture. And I am grateful that we learned about that. Not means, that means we have no religion or culture. And we believe God creates in his image, Adam and Eve. And we have only one rainbow signs, which is given to our father, Noah. I am asking you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to stop confusing children. Thank you. Thank you. Our next three speakers, please come forward. Sarah Fink, Mazaret Chaka, and Samira Hussein.
Sarah, you may begin. <coughs> My name is Sarah Fink, a tenured self-contained special education teacher in an alternate learning outcome program. We have a retention crisis. We have all identified the need to hire qualified staff for the numerous vacancies, but what we are overlooking is that for every vacancy in special education, there is a retention failure. Special educators of our most vulnerable populations are leaving. Reasons include increased workload due to vacancies and lack of time to complete necessary tasks as we provide coverage for these vacancies. All this with no additional compensation, resulting in burnout at an unprecedented rate. These programs provide an educational setting that cater to our most impacted students. Our students' high intensity needs include aggression to self and others, elopement, seizure disorders, and other demanding needs. There are classrooms without teachers and or support staff and a lack of substitutes for self-contained special ed. There are not enough adults to meet our students' needs and appropriate adult to child ratios. As such, inclusion and community-based instruction opportunities per their IEPs are no longer feasible, putting us out of compliance. Our kids deserve so much more. The current reality strips teachers of up to 90 minutes of their planning time each day, as we must support students in lunch, recess, and specials, just to maintain safety. This planning time is in place to complete time-sensitive, legally required case management of IEPs, lesson planning, formal educational assessments, grading, medical assistance, communication with parents, and so much more. I'm lucky my school ensures I get my 30 minutes each day, but that is not the case countywide. Most teachers work fight in fight or flight with no breaks and then go home and work two to three more uncompensated hours. It's not acceptable and it's not sustainable. While bonuses and an additional compensation may not be a panacea, it's our last chance at retention. We are in a retention crisis and we need your help. My colleagues and I invite you to spend a day in any one of our classrooms to truly understand the reality and severity of the current situation. Please take a moment to look at our four suggestions we have come up with on the paper in front of you. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Mesera, you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Mesera Chaka. I'm a Montgomery County resident and a loving mother of a daughter that goes to MCPS. I'm one of the many families who are being pushed to extreme stress and frustration by the school decision to make English language curriculum a medium to disseminate sexual fantasies and ideologies of LGBTQ community. One of the reasons I chose Montgomery County as my place of residence is the reputation of the school system, which was one of the best in this country. I have trusted the school system to teach the necessary skill my child needs to live a safe and prosperous life. Now, that trust is gone, and I'm only one of the many families who have lost trust in you. Those who are capable took their kids out of, to private school, and others who have the means move out, out of the county to protect their children's mind. How about those of us who cannot do either? Are our children now worth protecting? Must they be from wealthy families or from LGBTQ community to be protected? Make no mistake, the books you decided to add into the curriculum hurt children. The LGBTQ policies you choose to force on us divide communities. I, as a mother, ask you please consider my child to be a child. Or tell me, my child is in words of a protection unless she is from a family that share the sexual fantasies of the LGBT community. Thank you. Here you may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. Uh, my name is Samira Hussain, and I am a parent of four MCPS graduates and a community advocate. As we all are aware of the current um, event between Israel and Palestine, I, along hundreds of Palestinian parents, are disheartened by the situation as there is no excuse for pain and suffering on both sides. And we also know the social media and biased news creates further discrimination. And here we are feeling, uh, feeding again to the propaganda. We are disappointed by the, some of the statements made by MCPS administrators regarding recent violence in occupied Palestine. Let me read some of those examples. Quote, Early Saturday morning, Hamas terrorists launched an unprecedented attack on Israel from Gaza. Unquote. Another message says, we are saddened by the news of Hamas attack on Israel. Many of these statements are completely erasing the Palestinian perspective. 
and ignoring the impact and the, the current situation has on Arab, Arab Americans, and Palestinian students. The statements have focused on only one community and include harmful, violent contact directed toward Palestinians and Arabs. These are very disturbing, hate-promoting messages. They, are, will, they will bring more division among students and will tear families and communities. This is not the time or the place to be judgmental. All students and families should be treated equally, no favoritism and biases. We need to show compassion and, and stand strong and comfort those students uh, regardless of their ethnicity. The conflict has been going on for more than 70 years. We can't erase history, but we can make changes. What plans do you have to protect all of the kids? As professionals and educators, this is the time to put our personal differences and emotions aside and provide and support comfort those who are affected. We are, we mourn all lives. I'm, I'm gonna continue the, I'm the last one here. So. We have more, uh, yeah. we have more testimony. We have your okay. testimony, thank you. Can you uh, please pause for a minute and imagine one family from our families, from CPS families, just lost 14 members of their relatives. When they receive this um, uh, message, I just like to see, bring them here and let you look at them and see how their impression, their face has been telling them their families are terrorists. The bombs don't discriminate and don't ask for religion and person before the, the bombs goes off. Please be sensitive in your messages from now on. Thank you. If we could get our next speakers to please come forward. Tirsit, Walder Merriam, Linda Flores, and then we'll continue with our video testimony. May begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tersid. I am pronounced she, her, or hers. First of all, I appreciate the opportunity to ex express my thoughts again. I would like to stress that while it is essential to consider potential consequences, introducing discuss discussions about gender identity to minors is not suitable. Instead, let's redirect our focus to more pressing global issues such as climate change and resource depletion, which are crucial for the future of our children. For example, regions around Denver and Arizona are projected to express water shortage within the next 20 to 30 years, making this more urgent and serious concern. Shouldn't we prioritize addressing this matter and educating children on how to tackle this problem, type of problem? I firmly believe that we should. If we were to adopt the approach of countries like China in teaching electrical repair and handcraft skills, could we potentially create, cultivate a more productive generation? I believe we, we could. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Linda Flores, and uh, everyone has Linda's uh, testimony in English. Todos tienen su copia del testimonio en inglés para que si usted quiere leerlo en español, ellos pueden seguir en inglés. Gracias. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Linda Flores. Soy residente del condado de Montgomery y madre de dos estudiantes dentro del sistema de escuelas públicas del condado de Montgomery. Estoy aquí hoy para expresar mi profunda y genuina preocupación con respecto a la propuesta que NCPS está considerando actualmente, una propuesta que lamentablemente amenaza con desviarse de su compromiso inicial de adoptar una flota de autobuses escolares totalmente eléctricos. En cambio, hay una propuesta para comprar 90 autobuses de diésel, una medida que contradice el objetivo establecido de NCPS de electrificar su flota de autobuses escolares y eliminar las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero para el 2035. 
Esta acción es contraria al liderazgo que en CPS en sostenibilidad y a su compromiso de proteger la salud y el bienestar de nuestros estudiantes. Los autobuses escolares diésel emiten sustancias tóxicas que plantean graves riesgos para la salud tanto de los niños como de los conductores y al mismo tiempo contribuye a la actual crisis climática. Es imperativo señalar que los estudiantes negros, latinos y de bajos ingresos están desproporcionadamente expuestos a estas dañinas emisiones de diésel, lo que los convierte en los más vulnerables a los efectos adversos. Por lo tanto, les insto a oponerse a cualquier contrato que introduzca nuevos autobuses de diésel y a seguir invirtiendo en la opinión más limpia y responsable para nuestros queridos niños y nuestra comunidad. Los autobuses escolares eléctricos sin emisiones de escape. Les pido hoy que voten en contra de la propuesta de comprar nuevos autobuses escolares diésel en el futuro de nuestro medio ambiente, la salud de nuestros niños y la vitalidad de nuestra comunidad depende de esta decisión crucial. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Flores. Um, and just as a reminder, her testimony in English is on board docs, and she was testifying on us keeping our uh, electric school buses, not diesel school buses. And we'll be talking about that later on um, in our board meeting. Uh, President Sebastian, sorry to interrupt, but for a point of clarification, is there a way that we could read this in, in, in English for the people in the audience here who were not able to understand? Um, I do have the copy. I do. If you want to. Thank you. En el futuro, si nos avisa que viene, te podemos eh, tener un traductor para. Sí. Solo esta vez que. Pero quiero leer su testimonio en inglés para que las, las personas que están aquí presentes entiendan. Está bien? De nada. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Flores, and I am a resident of Montgomery County, and I'm a mother of two students with the Montgomery County Public School System. I am here today to express my deep and genuine concern regarding the proposal that MCPS is currently considering, a proposal that regrettably threatens to deviate from its initial commitment to adopting an all-electric school bus fleet. Instead, there is a proposal to purchase 90 diesel buses, a move that contradicts MCPS's established goal of electrifying their school bus fleet and eliminating greenhouse emissions by 2035. This action is contrary to MCPS leadership in sustainability and to its commitment to protect the health and well-being of our students. Diesel school buses emit toxic substances that pose severe health risks to both children and bus drivers. While contributing to the ongoing climate crisis, it is imperative to note that black, Latino, and low-income students are disproportionately exposed to these harmful diesel emissions, making them the most vulnerable to the adverse effects. Therefore, I urge you to oppose any contracts that will introduce new diesel buses and continue to invest in the cleanest, most responsible option for our beloved children and community. Zero tailpipe emission electric school buses. I ask you today to vote against the proposal to purchase any new diesel school buses. The future of our environment, the health of our children, and the vitality of our communities depend on this crucial decision. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Thank you. We now have three video testimonies. If you could please play the vi first video from Jax Kobe. Hello, Dr. McKnight and members of the Board of Education. As was proclaimed two meetings ago, October is LGBTQ History Month. So with that in mind, let me give you a quick summary of something that happened 50 years ago in MCPS. On August 29, 1972, Joe Akinfora began teaching earth science at Parkland Junior High. Then a month later, MCPS learned that Akinfora was gay and transferred him out of the classroom. When he filed a lawsuit against MCPS, the Board of Education, instead of apologizing, continued to fight against having an LGBTQ teacher in the classroom. Superintendent, Superintendent of Schools, Homer Ellsworth, confirmed that he would not hire a gay teacher or put back and forth back in a classroom without a direct court order because, quote, teachers have a tremendous impact on students and it is not possible to separate where a teacher stops being a teacher, end quote. Now, Today, MCPS has a non-discrimination statement. Yet, do you mean it? Am I able to talk about some of the amazing staff throughout MCPS without risking their termination? Can my teachers have, you know, pictures of their spouses on a desk without getting pushback? Akin Fora hasn't gotten any apology from MCPS in the 51 years since his termination. 
So let me ask, where does MCPS stand? Is it a non-discrimination statement, just like your proclamation of October being LGBTQ History Month, or both just words without action? Or are you going to stand up for the more than 10,000 LGBTQ students and staff members in MCPS? It's your choice. <coughs> Thank you. If we could play the next video, Abraham Sadat. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Abraham Sadat, and I'm testifying to you as a teacher from another school district in Maryland, as well as a member of the Coalition for Inclusive Schools and Communities. As the co-lead of the Equity School Improvement Team at my school this year, one of our aims is to collect more survey data pertaining to the experiences of our marginalized student populations, including our queer students. The lack of school level, district level, and state level data pertaining to the climate that our LGBTQ students have in our schools is unacceptable. We know that our LGBTQ students are marginalized from looking at national level data. We know that our queer students are more likely to experience homelessness, more likely to skip school, two to three times <laughs> more likely to be bullied, and five times more likely to attempt suicide than their non-queer identified peers. It is important for MCPS and all other school districts across Maryland to collect data pertaining to the climate that their LGBTQ plus students have and to ensure that safe spaces are established for all their queer students across all schools in the district. 20 years worth of research data from surveys uh, brought by the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network has revealed a positive correlation between the establishment of GSAs in schools and the mitigation of issues faced by LGBTQ plus youth. Thank you for listening. You have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you. The final video is from Zion Beg. Take 197. I'm just kidding. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, gather around. Today we're going to talk about something close to my heart. I'm Zion Beg, a parent of an MCPS student. And I want to talk about the Constitution, freedom-loving folks, and the right to choose, but all with a Muslim twist. And don't worry, we're not pitting anyone against each other. It's all about choice. You see, many in our Muslim community have used the Constitution to support LGBTQ rights, embracing the principle of equal protection under the law. And that includes love in all its beautiful forms. But guess what? Those very same constitutional rights they cherish, we also want them when we say we want the right to opt out of certain texts. Imagine the Constitution had a pause button. Oh, you don't want to read that section right now? Just press pause. Now, wouldn't that be convenient? Our fellow freedom-loving folks who fought for freedom and choice should surely understand the value of that. Remember the First Amendment? It's the opening act of the Constitution's grand performance, granting us freedom of speech, religion, and the press. Now, that freedom of speech part is significant. When we say we want the right to opt out of certain texts, it's akin to saying, hey, let me bookmark this conversation for later. I'll get back to it when I'm ready. And let's not forget the 14th Amendment, the star of the show, ensuring equal protection under the law. Our fellow freedom enthusiasts have grooved to its rhythm when it comes to LGBTQ rights. But why not dance to the same tune when it's about opting out? It's all about personal autonomy. Now, I know what you're thinking, but what about those lengthy group texts? Fear not, we're not talking about silencing entire communities. We're talking about the freedom to opt out of texts that don't align with our personal choices. So in conclusion, let's take a cue from freedom-loving folks, including our Muslim community and their LGBTQ fight for LGBTQ rights. The Constitution isn't a cafeteria where you can pick and choose your rights. It's an expansive freedom buffet, whether it's the freedom to love or the freedom to opt out of certain texts. It's all about choice. Thank you. That concludes our public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education for public comment is October 26, 2023. Sign-ups for public comment will open on Thursday, October 19, 2023 at 6 p.m. In addition to the online sign-ups for public comment, we will allow for in-person, same-day sign-ups when space allows. Unallocated slots may be filled on a first-come, first-served basis on the day of the meeting. In order to sign up in person, please arrive at least 15 to 20 minutes before the start of the open session and sign the form. In-person signups will close 15 minutes before public comment begins or when all slots are filled. Uh, before I turn to my colleagues for comments or questions, I will now turn to Dr. McKnight for her words. Oh, thank you so much, Ms. Avestri, and thanks for all who came in to share public comment today. 
um, everything that we talk about is insightful and thoughtful when we think about how we continue to work as a school system to prepare for the best opportunity for our students. I did want to circle back to Ms. Silvestri's comments made at the very beginning of the board meeting. Um, Ms. Silvestri shared with everyone that she would be submitting or the board had made a decision to submit and release the redacted version of the Jackson Lewis report and which many in our community have been, been asking for and I think it is indeed an important step for us in the right direction of restoring trust with the staff and the community. So thank you for all who've engaged. Following careful review of the report, I believe that the public will see what I've seen, and that is that there are many holes in the system, and we need to fix them, and that there needs to be accountability around fixing those holes. As a part of building trust, I want to be able to clearly communicate to our staff that this is important and as a result of that, there will be some transitions in personnel action that is coming. Last evening, I sent an email out to all of our administrators and supervisors and I shared an update on personnel changes. And I continue to pledge to keep our staff and community networks and all who are involved or have interacted or will continue to interact with our staff updated on those personnel changes because I think it's important to know who our connecting people will be that will continue to focus on the work of the school district. I also want to elevate the listening to lead component. When we spoke to county council the other week, um, and I will, the community will see this in which we share our 60-day action plan, I talked about the importance of listening to lead. Today in public comment, one of our speakers actually referenced that we've had a special education forum, and it was a lot of tough things that had to be discussed. I share that as an example of, as a school system, we commit to hearing tough feedback and to be able to hear what <laughs> systems are becoming arduous or difficult to work through because that is the only way that we're able to come to the right solutions. And so we will continue to hold sessions such as that to be able to model the mantra of what listening to lead is all about. And I also want to say that we're going to be diligent to put forth the corrective action plan that the board has charged me with developing and we're going to continue to fully cooperate with the investigations to do that. There are things that we will do right now to address some of the holes that I spoke about earlier. And then as we continue to revamp and develop better systems for the future, that means we will be doing a lot of building of what currently does not exist. But I want to commit to the community that that's not something I look for us to do alone or in isolation. And so we will be reaching out to make sure that we have partners to help us do that work along the way. Now, I want to really forward the conversation in front of us today to center us on maintaining our focus on children, supporting our students and staff as we continue to, to pursue the mission of making sure that our students are a success, are, are really successful academically, emotionally, and their overall growth is occurring in all the experiences that they have in the school system. And so this has been a very tough time for our students and our schools. So in order to be ready to learn, when we think about what our students need, our students' social and emotional well-being is always impacted by a host of factors. But I want to talk about one that's happening at this very moment that we all, all should be aware of. And it really does involve the hatred and violence perpetuated by acts of terrorism by Hamas and Israel. And I want to say that when we see these horrific things happening, I want us to recognize that many in our community, our friends, our families, the children in our school district are impacted personally in so many ways by this. They are human beings who are living through these experiences and they are still showing up to our schools every day trying to do what they normally do under very not normal circumstances. And so when they show up and they're carrying these burdens, many of the staff members are there trying to help them and support them. And so we have to be very thoughtful about their loss, grief, 
and how the apprehension of their loved one's safety are profound for them at this time. So they're walking around carrying many of these burdens and are very concerned about it. And so as we reach out to those in our community experiencing fear and anxiety for loved ones who are being impacted right now by terror, war, all of those things, let us remember that no one is immune to the impact of unthinkable violence, okay, at any point in time. Today I talked to the staff about there have been so many tragedies that, have ex that we have experienced I just think about the past five years. I mean, it's just been profound. When you think that something bad has happened, you say, this is the worst we've seen. And then something else happens, and it tops that. And our children and families are working through all of these unthinkable experiences, and they're playing out in the media in so many different ways, and in some ways, hurtful, hurtful. And it's, what's been most hurtful is to see at a time in which people need to come together and support one another. A lot of the things that are happening out there on social media and other places are actually dividing at a really bad time for everyone. So I just want to say we cannot let fear and anxiety divide us. We need to think about care and concern for one another. We need to think about how this is an opportunity truly for us to demonstrate the power of our diverse community and make sure that no one becomes a target, but everybody is getting the support that they need. And we might not be able to control what happens abroad, but we do have an obligation as a school system. And that's what I'm going to continue to center my messages in. What we can do something about is helping our children understand the world around them and negotiate the challenges in, will it, in which they have to work within. And we have an obligation to build community in our schools, and we're going to continue to do that. And so I just want to say the divisiveness around the conversations, all of those pieces, that's not who we are, and that's not what we're going to do. Our job is to support the children with what they need and everything that they need to be successful. And so I call upon all of us to do that, to take that seriously, and think about what that looks like in our actions, in our words, what we post, and most importantly, how we deal with one another. Because I think this is a shared commitment from all of us, but we actually have to show that. So our schools stand ready to support. We've sent out resources to help our schools. We also have set up Zoom sessions to have our leadership come into those Zoom sessions to really talk about the things that they need so that they can be able to support their staffs, their students, and their families abroad. So I just want to say, board, thank you for your support to us in allowing us to be able to provide those resources and support our students and families in the way that's meaningful to them. But I truly hope that this is something that continues to be elevated in our community around how we work with one another in challenging times because division during challenging times doesn't help any of us. That's when we must come together, most importantly. So thank you, Ms. Silvestri. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. I will now ask my colleagues to please turn the lights on. I think I saw the right turn on first, uh, Ms. Rivera Oven. Yes, uh, thank you. I um, just had a couple of comments on our retiree employees. And I don't know if we're going to be getting back to them with uh, just, it just doesn't seem, um, it doesn't make sense that when you're older and you retire, the specific things that you need are not available or reachable. And these are folks who have spent so much time in our system um, educating our children. So. I don't know if anybody is going to be able to to answer. Uh, uh, Can we turn some lights on so that everybody can see? Oh, there we go. So absolutely. I mean, uh, honestly, our retiree group is one of the most valuable. They always tend to come and step up when we need them most. And what we have done is really worked with them. And we, for the first time over this past year, and I think um, actually Deborah Monk, the president of the organization, spoke about this in one of her um, previous testimonies that we've started to meet with them regularly so that we can um, determine for them what some of those pain points are and how we're able to work through some of those issues. Some of the uh, we found in our plans have been um, plans that have been long standing in terms of the types of costs and, and things that we cover for retirees. It is they are accurate and it is not the same 
as active employees, we have heard from them about what are the things that they are most impacted by when they retire that will be the most beneficial to consider. So I know Mr. Hull has, I've met with them, Mr. Hull has continued to meet with them and will continue to do so to make sure that we are taking that into consideration when we evaluate um, our benefits and uh, the types of things that we can and can afford. And I think there are the most important step is communication. Yep. And are we still charging them for fingerprinting? No. no. They said that in their testimony. Right. That yeah, that was one sure, of the things I that we corrected. I just want to make sure that that's uh, across the board. And I just want to thank our student members who, who testified. Um, Mrs. Berry, who um, spoke about the challenges of special um, ed education, I know. Dr. McKnight, that this is something that you have been working on diligently and um, in making sure that, that this is such a great issue and such an important issue because we know we see in a lot of burnout in, in that community. So I appreciate um, everything that we're doing as a system to ensure that, um, that we're supporting our, our um, special ed educators. Bless you. And um, the... Uh, the other thing that I, I was uh, wondering is something that uh, the young people brought out with with the recycling. This is such an important issue um, to this generation because honestly, my generation did a poor job about it. <laughs> so um, I just want to make sure that there is a uniformity when it comes to providing these bins. And I think also just to, you know, there's a lot of even government buildings that don't follow these regulations. So I think as, as a system, not just even MCPS, but Montgomery County government is not that great about recycling um, in, their own, uh, in their own. So this is something we all need to work at it. But I'm just wondering if we are gonna, going to uh, be able to have, because I know the young people are eager, they're willing to be engaged, they are engaged, they're doing amazing things. So. Yep, thank you for that question. And, um, you know, we certainly agree that recycling is uh, one of the many important things that we're doing, uh, that this generation is doing to improve the uh, environment. So we do have recycling bins at all of our schools. There should be, you know, uh, all three types, and there should be plenty of them. But we can certainly work with our building service workers to make sure that those are deployed across, you know, all of our schools and are accessible in multiple locations. Ms. Wolf. Yes, I wanted to thank our special educators who came here today. They have one of the hardest jobs. I mean, all of our jobs are hard, but I do recognize what they have been dealing with, having gone out to the schools and seen it for myself. I do want you to know that the union did raise this issue the other day in our meeting with them. If you have suggestions, we're willing to hear them. But as you know, the the hiring of special educators has been very difficult for every school district. So we are open to suggestions. Um, I also wanted to talk to Mr. Tesler about the innovative schools. When I came out to visit there, that was a problem that was mentioned, that the students don't show up for the first month. And I wanted to make sure that our notices about the innovative schools tell people when they actually begin, because a lot of people move into the community during the summer, and they don't know that they're on a different school schedule. So it's very important that they have notice about where they have moved and what their options are. So the, the third thing I wanted to point out was for Ms. Joseph, the minority and disabled participation in our procurement process has been one of my major concerns since I have been here. In fact, it's one of the things that I often talk about and I know that that's included in our strategic plan and I'm looking to see improvement this year. Thank you. Ms. Harris. Yeah, just echoing uh, the comments of my uh, colleagues and um, I just wanna say I got a message just now from um, my colleague, um, Ms. Dublinsky, who helps support the Student Climate Action Council. And um, so we have 14 Student Climate Action Council members. We have 200 climate ambassadors. And we will operationalize them to do a survey at their school to see about the availability of recycling bins. Um, are they appropriately deployed? 
and um, are they being used? That's another question, whether they're being there or being used different. And then um, do we know from building services that they're being, um, at, the, at the end of it, are they actually being emptied into the appropriate receptacle? So the students, once again, are on it. Um, and uh, just about um, Ms. Revere Oven raised a question about uh, Ms. Monk and Ms. Gray's testimony. We will be at the um, November Fiscal Management Committee meeting, you know, taking a look at um, all of our funds, ERSKI, and so we can maybe take a deep, little deeper dive on this issue there and review everything that you just shared, but just to make sure that we are um, very clear about what, what the differences are and what we're doing to um, ensure there's equity. So we can make sure that we put that on the agenda. Um, and I did appreciate the diversity of comment we had today, lots of different issues. It was very interesting. Um, and I did look at uh, Ms. Fink's four suggestions, and they're, they're very, um, I think we should take a look at them. They make, uh, they seem like a lot of, just a lot of common sense to me. Um, and I did want to emphasize, we had testimony from um, a commenter about the selection of uh, Dr. McKnight's anti-racist advisory group. I, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the, the process or how that's being uh, operationalized, but I have heard from some in the community that they felt like um, their perspectives were not, they weren't being provided the opportunity to participate or be considered for participation and just wondering how we are um, reaching out to all aspects of our community with the opportunity. Thank you. I'm actually going to ask Ms. Sharon to come down to the table. It is her office that actually runs the membership of the, I'm sorry, Elba, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> come on down, Elba, the uh, membership of the advisory groups. I do want to say that the expectation has been we know that we won't ever get enough voices just through the membership of the advisory group. That's why we intentionally go beyond that and put out information generally for everyone to be able to participate in um, the conversation. But Ms. Garcia? Hello, everyone. Um, so the intention of this um, commu superintendent's community advisory um, group is to is twofold, is to continue the conversations that started with the steering committee of the anti-racist system auto, but it's also an opportunity for Dr. Mainai to continue her listening to learn <laughs> sessions with a larger community so that we begin um, building communities within our larger MCPS community. So we did an outreach to multiple members of the former steering committee advisory group and additional advisory groups, the faith advisory, the feed advisory, and we put in a um, community message asking for new voices, and we have so far about 39 nominations from multiple stakeholder groups. Um, we have, for the first time, um, from the Ethiopian community, which we haven't heard before. We had um, several from the Muslim community, several from multiple communities, from the Latino community, and we're continuing doing outreach um, because we want to make sure that we have representation from early childhood, from you know, from multiple voices that we haven't heard as much as we wanted to. So we're in the process of doing that. We are not over yet with the nomination process. I'm actually reaching out to the gentleman who spoke um, earlier today. Um, so we are still nominating and talking to groups that we haven't heard before. Um, and again, in an attempt to um, have Dr. Mainide have access to multiple voices um, within the community so that we can, we can continue building. So if any of you hear from anybody else that is interested, I am the point person. They can reach out to me and I will definitely um, um, get them involved. Um, I'll be happy to share with you um, a timeline of what we've been doing so far and when the meetings have been scheduled so that everybody is aware. Thank you. Any questions? No? Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. And just a last comment. Thank you very much to Ms. Flores for her testimony. And we will be talking about the diesel buses later today. Stay tuned. Mr. Said? Two quick things. Uh, the first was actually a question about composting bins. So I know we're talking about recycling bins, but I know composting is a new movement. Do we have composting bins in all the high schools? If not, like what high schools? Where's the push for middle schools? Because I know that's really big as well. So I was just curious about that. Yep. So my understanding is that um, we do not, the system does not sponsor um, composting, but that uh, there are several schools where students um, have, you know, gathered and, and sponsored that. There, of course, is a cost to that, um, although it obviously is an important uh, piece as well. 
Okay, great. I know my school has some great student leaders uh, who are sponsoring composting, so I, I would definitely encourage the continued use of that. And then the second thing I just want to say is I just wanted to echo everything that Dr. McKnight said about you know the current conflict going on. What's necessary is to look at both sides, to look at everything, to not you know pick a side, but to remain open-minded and try and look at things impartially and really acknowledge just the terrible things that you know this has caused for so many families you know I don't you know the right words for it but I think it's it's sad for everyone across the board to see what's going on now and it's, it's just terrible and I just want to reiterate that right now it's not about picking sides it's about hearing people and I also want to acknowledge that I've seen so many students on social media take the right approach and push for a united front and push for looking at both sides and everything like that and I just want to kind of give thanks to all the students who I think are leading the discussion on trying to make this issue representative for everyone involved and not just picking sides. So I just wanted to thank the, the numerous posts on social media that I've seen from students who are trying to do that and just reiterate that we must remain united, especially in this, these times, as you said, Dr. McKnight. So I just wanted to say that. If there are no other comments, then we can uh, move on to our next agenda item. And that is agenda item number six. Uh, and we will be having a discussion on student data pathway milestone meets or exceeds grade level or core standards in math and English language arts, grades four to five. Um, again, there's a lot going on in our school district, but we are keeping our eye on the prize, which is student achievement. Um, and I look forward to the conversation. Dr. McKnight. Thank you, President Silvestri. So today we're going to share our third presentation related to the academic milestones and the pathway to college career and community readiness. Um, the third academic milestone indicator in the pathway of college career and community readiness is to meet or exceed math and English language arts grade level or core standards in grades five, four and five. So that's what we're going to be uh, sharing today. Um, this indicator is measured by the Maryland Comprehensive Assessive Pro Assessment Program, which you'll often hear us refer to as the MCAP or the MCAP assessments, um, or the Dynamic Learning Maps Assessment in each of the areas. So this indicator is different from past presentations about math and literacy data because of that. So I just want to highlight that. Um, beginning in grade four, students are reading to learn and apply literacy and mathematics skills to think critically and solve problems. College career and community readiness provide requires proficiency in both literacy and mathematics. And so by examining both together, we're going to obtain a better understanding of what not only our students know, but what they're able to do as they begin to engage in the different uh, activities that we have for them. So what we're going to share today is our baseline data for milestones, which includes grade four and five students, and tested during the 22-23 school year. So that would be last year's data that we're going to be reflecting on today. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Pugh at this point, who's going to pick up on the presentation. And welcome to the table. Thank you, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. We're excited to be back again, um, sharing more of the data story here in Montgomery County Public Schools for our students. Next slide, please. As Dr. McKnight said, this is a different one because each of the previous three uh, reports we've come to you has had a single data point. And so this is getting a little bit more complicated because it's actually two data points for two grades. Um, next slide, please. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, what we have for you is an overview. Again, same pattern. We'll talk about what the pathway is, where we are in the pathway. The purpose of the pathway is really to be transparent with our community, with our families, with our teachers, with each of you, to make sure that we're all understanding where our students uh, were and are. So this one, again, Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program in Mathematics and Literacy, and we have our experts here at the table in mathematics and also from our special education office to help us with specially designed instruction and speak to the dynamic learning maps, which is an alternative assessment. Um, we'll again share data analysis. Uh, this one will be a little different again because we want to show you where we are in relation to the state and in relation to ourselves, the past year um, data points, and then we'll show you what it looks like when it's put together because that's what our milestone is for students. Um, 
when we talk about what are we doing in response to that data, we're really excited with the support that the board has uh, and the superintendent and the county council have all approved in investing additional uh, funding to support our math specialists. And we'll hear a little bit about what they're doing. So we're excited to bring that to you and then enter into discussion. So next slide, please. For uh, your re reference, this is our pathway to college career and community readiness. And we've really been talking only about the academic indicators. And today, we're talking specifically about the academic indicators indicated there for grades four and five. We'll come back and do six through eight because it gets complicated when you're looking at that much data. So it's really important we'll finish off our elementary school focus and make sure we're discussing um, those students who are meeting or exceeding grade level standards in math and English. The Maryland and College and Career Ready standards are the solid standards. They've been well researched. They've been created and adopted. Um, many people have had input in it. Uh, many research have, ha have had input in it. And we here in Montgomery County believe that those are good indicators of students being uh, prepared for college and community, beginning in the uh, third grade, actually, when they start taking, they take these assessments three through eight, and then again in 10th uh, grade in Algebra one. So for today, focusing on the grades four and five, we believe that if students can meet these standards in both math and English, that they are on a great trajectory to make it through. One of the pieces that I wanted to share with you is that a lot of work has been done around helping our families and community uh, digest the framework and also be able to ask questions about their own students and what their performance is. So every student gets an individual school report from the state, very long, lengthy, dense document, but it is color coded and it does have a student's performance listed on it. For our, for our families, what the um, team has created is a document that actually goes through and says what is the benchmark? What are what is it that the standard that the student needs to meet at those levels and then specific questions that parents can ask based on their students. They can ask questions based on what they learned about what their students strengths are, what their students areas for um, support are. And so we were hope, hopeful that as we're building this language around accountability and making sure that we're working together to provide what it is our students need, that we're preparing things that are clear and easy to understand. So we also wanted to, I also wanted to elevate to you that we are looking specifically at a math spotlight. We've had the last few presentations have been on ELA and early literacy and our big significant work done in our shift to uh, the science of reading and structured literacy. But we're equally excited about the deep work that's happening in our mathematics um, classrooms. So at this time, next slide, I'll turn it over to Simone. Thank you, Dr. Fee. Good afternoon. My first time. I've seen all the lights go on. Good afternoon, uh, President Silvestri, members of the board. Dr. McKnight is not here with us. My name is Simone Guinness, and I am the supervisor for the Special Designed Instruction Unit with the Office of Special Education Services. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit more about the dynamic learning maps um, that are specifically for students who are not working towards a high school diploma. These are students um, who actually have, they do not participate in the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program. Um, because it's not appropriate for them even when they have their accommodations. These students are, um, are students with significant cognitive disabilities um, who participate in an alternate state assessment called daily learn, excuse me, dynamic learning maps in grades three through eight and also in grade 11. So um, these students, while they're not working towards a high school diploma, they are actually working towards a Maryland Certificate of Program Completion. And what the, di the, the dynamic learning maps does is it works towards essential elements. And those elements are um, expectations that are aligned with English language arts, mathematics, and science instruction. This year, this past spring in 2023, the student performance data for our students with the most significant disabil significant cognitive disabilities were included in our milestone data. And, um, and so, we want to make sure um, that these students are included because the work of the essential elements are aligned with the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards. 
I will now turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Berlinger. Next slide. Good afternoon, President Silvestri. Dr. McKnight will be back momentarily. Board of Education. Um, I'm Sheila Berlinger. I'm a member of the Montgomery County Jewish Educators Alliance. And the next thing I get to say for the very first time at this table, I am one of two co-supervisors for elementary mathematics. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to start with a quick overview of the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program. On the screen, you'll see a brief description of each content area. By federal law, as Dr. Pugh referenced, Maryland is required to assess the students in English language arts and in mathematics every year from grades three through eight. Okay, in Maryland, these assessments are measuring the achievement students are demonstrating on the Maryland College and Career Ready Standards. Next slide, please. So the students represented in the report we're going to share today, the data we're going to look at are, uh, were last year's fourth and fifth graders, students who are currently sitting in fifth and sixth grade respectively. But what we wanted to do is give you a little bit of context about who they are and what their elementary journey has looked like. All right, these are our last remaining students who were most highly impacted by COVID. All right, so when you take a look at these students, you're going to see um, that they have some challenges. We have different groups that have some challenges, and we have some very specific actions underway um, in order to address those challenges, okay? Our current second graders are the first group of students who would have had an uninterrupted educational experience coming out of COVID. All right, I'll give you a moment to look at that. Next slide, please. So we're gonna start with math performance and I'm gonna go ahead and orient you to what you're seeing on the screen. This is math performance for last year's fourth and fifth graders, as I just mentioned. When you look at the graph, you can see from the very bottom, the left half are last year's fourth graders and the right half is fifth grade data, all right? Let's just look at the fourth grade data for a moment. The fourth grade data is represented by the students who were in fourth grade in 2022 in Montgomery County and then the students who were in fourth grade in 2023 in Montgomery County. The first purple and the first teal bars. The second set of data where it says Maryland math for, those are all of Maryland's fourth graders in 2022 and all of Maryland's fourth graders in 2023. What we're pleased to see is that the students in fourth grade in Montgomery County in 2022 and 2023 are outperforming the state overall. What we're not pleased to see is what the overall percentage of students achieving proficiency continues to be. When you look on the right half of the graph, same data for grade five, 2022, 2023, Montgomery County compared to Maryland. Again, outperforming the state, not at the level that we're pleased with yet. And I'd like to point out that year over year from 22 to 23, the percentage of students achieving proficiency continues to grow. All right, next slide, please. Actually, can we go back one? I wanted to point out one other piece of information because we slice and dice this data in a lot of different ways. And one of the things we're really curious about is how far away are we from how, per, how many of our students are achieving proficiency? And what we're able to see with the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, the score of 750 is or higher is the score you need to achieve in order to be considered proficient, 750 or higher. So we went ahead and looked at the data for students sitting from 740 to 749. Like who's this close? Mm -hmm. This close. That amounts to two, maybe three questions on the test. For our fourth graders, another 17% of the students are sitting in that window. And for our fifth graders in math, another 16.5% are sitting in that window. We've got the next group of kids this close, so what are we gonna do about it? I'm gonna talk about our actions in a little bit, but I want you to know that we're not just looking at did you make it or not, but where is everybody, okay? And how are we progressing? We did the same thing with English language arts. Now, next slide, please. The data is going to be presented in the same way. You're gonna see grade four, you're gonna see grade five in a moment for English language arts. Next slide. Next please. slide, please. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so similar pattern. On the left, English language arts grade four, both Montgomery County and Maryland. 
On the right, grade five, Montgomery County is outperforming Maryland again. The levels of students achieving proficiency, still not as high as we want them. And from one year to the next, more students are achieving proficiency with each passing year. Still not at the level we want, but moving in the right direction. Okay, I'll give you a moment to look at that. With ELA, with English language arts, it's very, very similar. Those students sitting in that little window of 740 to 749 needing two or three more questions, you've got just about 16% in grade four, 17% in grade five, this close. So we've just got to put our foot on the gas a little bit harder, right? We're getting there. We're getting there. All right, next slide, please. So one of the questions we frequently want to uh, make sure we address for you is not just how are all of our students doing, but how are each of our groups of our students doing? And that's what you see on this slide right now. This is math in grade four by racial or ethnic group and students receiving services. Again, with our grade four students, our levels achieving proficiency are not where we want them. Purple still represents 2022. Teal represents 2023. Each year, the numbers are getting a little bit higher and a little bit higher. Not where we want them, but in the right direction. Yes. Just a, a clarifying question. Looking at this graph, so some, some students are going to be represented in more than one of these groups. They will. Mm -hmm. They will. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. You're going to see grade five. Grade five is similar, but we have a different kind of call to action in grade five. As you look across this, while most groups are showing that more students are achieving proficiency from one year to the next, our fifth grade emerging multilingual learners did not. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm going to speak to some very specific actions that are already underway and how we're beginning to address this a little later on. I just want to give you the whole landscape of the data, okay? So that's grade five in math. Next slide is going to show you grade four in English language arts. You're going to see the same pattern repeat itself. In grade four, each group of students from one year to the next, we have more students achieving proficiency. Not at the levels we want yet, but increasing. Next slide shows grade five, grade five English language arts and grade five math. Same challenge, it's that same group of students who are those emerging multilingual learners where we have fewer students demonstrating proficiency in this one grade level. And it is a red flag and it is a call to action and we have begun to take action. So what I just showed you very, at a very, very high level is the data around mathematics and the data around English language arts, which you, many of you have heard me speak to before at this very same table. One data point, then the other data point. The pathway says if our children are truly college and career ready, they're successful at both. It's not enough to have just one or the other. Next slide, please. So today we're here to talk about that overlap the kids in the middle of the Venn diagram, right? We've got kids who are successful at math. We have kids that are, and by successful I mean, meeting or exceeding proficiency at the grade level standard as measured by the Maryland State Assessment, the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment. For our children to truly be college and career ready, they have to be successful on both. So as a system, we've collect, we're beginning to measure who those children are and how we get all of them there. So this is the baseline, the first year we've looked at this data in this way. All right, next slide, please. So on the screen, what you see now are the percentage of students in grade four who met or exceeded proficiency in both math or English, math, I'm sorry, math and English language arts. That very first circle speaks to the entire fourth grade. And then each subsequent circle speaks to each of our racial and ethnic groups. As expected, the gap in achievement continues to persist. And that's the work we're doing to, to, to really um, level that playing field and make sure that we're reaching our most marginalized students. The next slide before I go to it is going to show you the students disaggregated by students receiving services. You're going to see the same alarming data point that we saw mm -hmm. around our emerging multilingual learners. Next slide, please. In terms of the percentage of students 
in these categories who have achieved proficiency or exceeded it in both math and English language arts. There's work to be done. There is work underway. And this is unsatisfactory. I'm going to turn it back over to my partner, Ms. Guinness, over here, and she's going to take you through the fifth grade data. Thank you. Next slide, please. OK, so as we look at the um, ELA and mathematics data for our fifth grade students, we see similar patterns that are aligned um, to, to, by race, the disparities between our select um, student groups, between Asian and white students versus our other student groups of black, African-American, Hispanic students. So this slide shows the data disaggregated by race. It is important that we look at this with an anti-racist lens as we monitor and analyze student performance in both ELA and mathematics. Um, using the school improvement plan process, we analyze individual school data. And we're working to, with the schools as they, we provide support through an anti-racist lens. Um, we really want to promote stu increased student achievement with a cross-functional team. Um, we identify, develop, and monitor ongoing professional learning that will impact a priority in literacy, mathematics, student well-being, school culture. Next slide. And as seen before, our fifth grade data is lower than our fourth grade data. And I just want to call out that um, while MCPS continues to make gains and outperforms um, the state, with student proficiency rates on the Maryland Comprehensive um, Assessment Program and ELA and Mathematics. This is still a critical area of need. We must narrow the achievement gap um, for all students, specifically calling out our special education students and our students who receive English language development services. Um, in demonstrating mastery of the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards or the alternate academic achievement standards um, so a little later in our presentation, you're going to hear a little bit more about how we are um, aligning our resources, what are we doing to support schools, building the capacity of our central office as well as our school-based staff members. We are also looking at a, implementing accountability um, structures to ensure that, again, in all caps, all students are able to thrive and accelerate during effective first instruction that is aligned to the state standards and customized to meet the needs of the students. As noted before, these students were directly impacted by school closures and distance learning during the pandemic. Um, to address this, we have increased staffing to directly target supports for schools that include math coaches, English language development coaches, a specially designed instruction unit, and profesh targeted professional learning. Next slide. So for the specially designed instruction, here are some of the priority focus areas um, and how we are responding to meet the needs of students who are receiving special education and related services. Um, specially designed instruction is really how we adapt the content, the methodology, and the delivery of instruction to meet the individual needs of students based on how their disability impacts them during learning. For example, during a math lesson on fractions, a teacher might, in the whole group for the whole class, start and introduce fractions by using a pizza pie to break apart to show the part to the whole and how they are related. However, for our students with disabilities who, who their disability directly impacts them in the area of math, we may want to do something more intensive, such as giving them um, tactile or tangible representation of blocks that might look like a pizza pie. We might even have um, a pie chart where it might be cut out with pieces where the students can see, again, the whole to part so they can see it, they can touch it, and they can manipulate it. Um, we also may want to think about how are we making sure that we are pulling students out, we're reminding them about the strategies that they're receiving, and ensuring that we are teaching them specially designed instruction with fidelity. I will now turn back to Mrs. Berlinger. Um, and next slide, please. 
So I'm going to start with thank you. It's the vision of this board and our superintendent that leads to what I'm a piece of what I'm about to share with you all. There have been some incredible resources added to elementary mathematics this year, and they're already making a difference. Primarily, they came in the form of instructional math coaches. We have eight of them. And I want to share with you a few words from one of our elementary school principals who has an instructional math coach assigned to him. This comes from Mr. Emmanuel Jean-Philippe, the principal of our COLA. In an email he shared, a common question principals get asked is, what kind of supports do you need? Well, your team connected us with Julie Kelly, who has already started to seamlessly influence the depth of discussions teachers are having with data during planning and the decisions that need to be made instructionally. Thank you for all that you and your team are doing. So we have eight elementary instructional math coaches, and they support either four or five schools. They have one grade level team per school, and they intensively focus on the cycle of preparing to teach, implementation of instruction and feedback to the teacher, and progress monitoring. Their calendars, day in and day out, have them at the table planning and have them in the classrooms. They provide true micro job embedded support by consistently being present to model, lead, and provide feedback. That's what they do. If you open their calendars in Outlook, that's what you would see. So we wanted you to have a chance to hear it from one of our coaches and from two teachers that she supports. We have a very short video for you. We did not bring them here because we're not pulling a coach away from supporting a team or a group of teachers in a classroom, but they were willing to record on Zoom for you. So if I could have our, our tech friends go ahead and play our video for you. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Carla Britt, co-supervisor of Elementary Math. I'm excited for you to hear about the work of the newly allocated instructional math coach position at Glen Allen Elementary. Thank you to Ann Heflin, principal at Glen Allen, for being our partner. Please take a moment to introduce yourselves. Rachel? Hi, I'm Rachel Dance. I, this is my first year as one of the new instructional math coaches and I support Glen Allen, Harmony Hills, Carl Sandburg Learning Center, and Veers Mill. Hi, I'm Amran Ansimi. And I'm Haley Brookhart. We teach fourth grade together here at Glen Allen. Great. Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about your first experience with this team at Glen Allen? Sure. The team was very welcoming, and they invited me into model curriculum study to showcase what it could look like to study the standards, do the math, and provision for scaffolds. And they even encouraged me to jump in on my very first visit to walk them through analyzing their first equip pre-diagnostic of the year. That's a great first experience. Mm -hmm. Amra and Haley, what has been the most meaningful to you, each of you, having this additional shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder team level support with planning and instruction? Really just knowing we have a coach here who's focused on helping us improve our practices and asking us questions that help us reflect has been helpful. But also when we were able to study the end of module assessment and plan those with the end in mind, this has been able to help me and the team choose areas of focus and common formatives that will help students be the most successful. Yeah, and to add to that, Rachel has helped me and the team be more intentional about analyzing that student data. And for example, this week, we are given our second equip pre-diagnostic assessment, and we've already planned that time that we're going to analyze the data and begin planning supports for students during our next curriculum study. That's terrific. Rachel, we know you started the year with this fourth grade team, but the goal is for coaches to work with different grade levels throughout the school year. Can you explain how this works? Yeah. So part of my role is to provide ongoing feedback at the team level. Um, using planning and instructional, instructional look for documents. Um, and the data collected helps the team reflect on their strengths and their areas of growth. Um, so as we engage in curriculum study together, I observe instruction with the teams, ask questions and get group feedback. Um, this encourages teams to reflect on their current practices and helps team members take ownership of their time together and then allows me to transition to the next grade level. We're excited to hear about how well things are going at Glen Allen and the impact the coach is already having on your instructional practices and student learning. 
Thanks again, Amra and Haley and Rachel for taking a few minutes to share about the new instructional math coaches work in action. Y'all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. you too. I'm just gonna give a quick shout out to my partner, Carla Britt, who's sitting right behind me. And thank you again for my partner. Um, if we could go on to the next slide, please. Thank you again to Glen Allen Elementary and Anne Heflin, and a quick shout out. Today's her birthday. Happy birthday, Anne. Um, so you've seen a lot of data, and I kept saying we're going to come back and talk about the actual actions we're taking. One of them is these instructional math coaches assigned to schools specifically by data that shows area of need. Uh, the data was surfaced through their curriculum aligned assessments and how their students are performing on achieving grade level standard, particularly for students receiving special education services and those identified as emerging multilingual learners. So those were prioritized because those are students, as you can see by the data, um, who are in greatest need and whose teachers need more tools in their toolbox. So that is one action that we are currently taking. Um, another one. So it's really, really important to ensure that we are building collaborative teams across our offices, mine and Simone's, um, working with the Department of Emerging Multilingual Learners as we're providing support to the schools for their students. Um, and so we have actions in play and partners on the ground in schools who are doing some of that work. In math, we work closely with Ms. Guinness and her team focused on that specially designed instruction to ensure students receiving special education services can receive the grade level learning. She has instructional specialists who partner with mine to provide professional learning to schools in their workday, in their setting. For emerging multilingual learners, members of the math team attended their summer training around the English language development, and the learning is then worked into the guidance that is given to school teams throughout the school year. So for, let me give you an example. Um, this summer, the one of the outcomes um, at the, at the language development training was for participants to be able to describe instructional practices for integrating language learning and content learning. And then what happened was we take that learning directly into the training for elementary math leaders in every building where they examine instructional delivery expectations so that they can name the places and the ways that language development should be happening side by side with the content development and then they can take it right back to teachers. It goes back to that targeted professional learning that Ms. Guinness referenced just a few minutes ago. The collaborative effort across our central office teams focuses on making sure that the tools schools are using are explicitly addressing these needs. As a school implements their school improvement plan, classroom visit data that's reflective of the planning and progress monitoring will also be critical as an accountability measure to ensure that these tools are moving forward, that we're moving from learning as adults, from learning how to do something new, to using it in the classroom, and to making sure it's having an impact on children and their achievement. I'm now going to turn the presentation back to President Silvestri and the board for discussion. Board members, if you have questions, please turn your lights on. Ms. Wolf. Um, I want to thank you for this report and for your enthusiasm. But it just about brings tears to my eyes when I look at the, the numbers for African American students and, and uh, limited English speaking students. Um, I wonder, have we looked around the country to see if there are any other districts that are having success with those particular groups and exactly what they're doing? <laughs> the, the short answer is yes. And I, um, we've had opportunities to begin to uh, attend experiences such as the Unbound Ed Standards Institute, where we're digging further into looking at those strategies and structures that are necessary to be in place and those conditions that need to be created to ensure that our students receive that grade level engaging, affirming, and meaningful instruction. That's at the root of making sure that our students can be successful. And that's at the heart of some of the professional learning that we're providing because it is the backdrop for what each of our students needs and we're inconsistent in our ability to do that yet. What is called? Did you? Um Wait a minute, Julie. No. Did you, um, I would like to get uh, numbers 
broken down for each school. Since you're using this as baseline data, mm -hmm. then I want to be able next year to look at each and every school and see actual improvement. Okay. I think I ask for this all the time, yes. so you may have already provided it and I missed it. But I, you know, it, it almost brings me to tears. I can hardly even talk about what I'm seeing mm -hmm. here right now. Thank you. Ms. Yang? Yes, uh, thank you, thank you. And I appreciate you identifying the students who are getting close to the benchmark. I think we need to celebrate approximations, right? But like you said, this is unsatisfactory results. Even our highest groups, it's about 60%, 50%. And look at our English language learners and African-American group. And so this, this breaks my heart. But my question is, why is this base, baseline? Because MCAP isn't, we, do we have MCAP over time? Why don't we have longitude data? That's an excellent question. We, we will have MCAP over time. We used to have an assessment called PARC, and we used to have the um, data over time. When the pandemic hit, they were in the process of creating a new standards-aligned assessment, and so what happened is everything got pushed back and delayed for them to administer the new test and then do what they needed to do to set standards. Um, it's a long process to set standards and then get feedback back. So what you saw there in the two years data was actually the beginning of the year. So if a student was in uh, third or fourth grade one year, at the beginning of their next year in the fall of 2021, they took a shortened version of the MCAP. That gave us our first set, but I really wouldn't call it baseline. It wasn't after, a, you know, it wasn't a normal school year for one, we were still in the pandemic. And for two, it was not at the end of the school year. It, it, there was a summer break in between there. So this past year was the first year that we had a full school year between the beginning of the year and the end of the year. And moving forward, we will be able to compare year over year and we'll be able to compare the students themselves year over year. Thank you for that. Now, my question is really trying to understand a little bit about the math coaches, right? We, uh, that's a new investment, mm -hmm. and I'm so glad to hear their perspective on how things are working. But really tell me, though, um, if I'm a student, Josh, who is underperformed, right, not meeting the benchmark, how is my day now? different from how is my math instruction now really different from last year uh, with the math coaches in place? So the intention, that's an excellent question. The intention is that the math coach is able to serve uh, and address multiple pieces of what you just asked. First, when sitting at the table and planning with the teachers, they are breaking down the grade level standard, comparing it to the assessment in order to determine the degree to which the student needs to demonstrate learning. And then they're bringing additional skills and knowledge and tools to the table so that the teachers are able to identify how they're going to differentiate the interactions that children are going to have in the classroom in order to meet them where their learning need is. And this isn't something that teachers always have time to study at a deeper level. But having someone at the table with them every week, shoulder to shoulder, to lead them through planning this way is going to deepen the teacher's knowledge and understanding both of the mathematics and the pedagogy of how to teach it. So when Josh's teacher walks in the room, Josh's teacher has a plan exactly for Josh that they may not have had prior. And then the coach is going to come with Josh's teacher into the classroom, and if the teacher has requested it, the coach might be modeling how to execute mm. the practice or giving feedback when the teacher does it. So it sounds like it's much more individualized to, to Josh's need. Now then, tell me, do you have plans to evaluate at the end of the year our investment on these uh, math coaches? Right? Absolutely. Because, and, and, um, and also, tell me, because you said that right now they're working with one particular grade in one particular school, or, or four or five schools. Is it the plan that they rotate among 
grades? Uh, is that for future years? Two questions, I actually. Yes, I'm going to answer the second half, and then I'm going to let Dr. Pugh answer the first half. Okay. Um, the, the second half is, as Rachel was attempting to explain, and we haven't tried it yet, but the idea is that these coaches are working themselves out of a job. When I can get a grade level team and a team leader or a math leader in a building or a staff development teacher to be independent with planning at the depth that I was just describing, the coach can move to the next grade level team in a building. So we're hoping that we're going, in, and it's going to be at different pace in different buildings with different teams as their skills get stronger. Um, but we do anticipate that we're going to be able to move from one team to another. The coaches have reflective tools that they use um, day in and day out about the degree to which they're being successful at the table with the agenda and the strategies and skills they want the teachers to be able to demonstrate in planning and in teaching so that they can continue to improve and strengthen the skills for the team and for the school and for the student. But from a more formal standpoint, um, Dr. Pugh gonna, can explain um, the evaluation process. Right, so at the beginning of the year, you heard a presentation on uh, what was being selected to be evaluated in an effort to show true accountability for the investments that have been made. And so the math coaches, along with the opportunity coaches, were um, selected as part of that formal evaluation. Because it'll be year one, it'll be an evaluation of our implementation. So all of the notes and things that you referenced about what they're doing and what they're seeing in terms of impact on student outcomes, that'll be the first level of the evaluation. Thank you. Ms. Rivera-Albany? Yeah, OK. Um, I'm going to echo my colleague, uh, Mrs. Wolf. This is, you know, this is sad. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really. Um, so I have a few questions for you. I know you said you had a multilingual um, team that looks at the um, at the EML curriculum. I'm just wondering how big is that team? How robust is that team? Because obviously, <laughs> three people. So, but no, no. That's. But let me just let me just let me just finish my thought before I forget. Um, so when I look at this data, right, um, I really was hoping that our numbers were going to be better for last, last school year. And I think, but then when I look at the EML data, there's a significant decrease in achievement. So something's not working. And it's quite obvious. So when you say to me that you have a team of three people to be able to cover, um, sorry, I'm really upset about this. <laughs> Let me just take a second. <sighs> take your time. Just wanted to clarify, what are we talking about? Three team of three people? Of For the what? EML with the English uh, learners. Is that what you understand? So in the Department of English and Multilingual Learners, there are three people here. That doesn't mean that there aren't people in every school. So there are teachers and instructional specialists in the schools who work beside the math specialists. And thank you, Tamara Hewlett, <laughs> yes, for coming up to us. Because, I, because I, I, don't, I don't want you to think that we don't have people who are working on this. The people here are small, but the people in the schools who are working um, with teachers on how to implement the language uh, strategies that we know will help with language acqu acquisition are, are in the schools. So, so and, and you can answer her that, but before, before I go on, we're talking about kids who are not going to be ready to move on to the next step, and we're still going to move them on in a sense. And then they're going to be behind in sixth grade. And then they're going to be behind in seventh grade. And then they're going to be behind in eighth grade. So for me, and I know we just started the math coaches. And then when I listen, you know, um, to the great people that are doing this, four schools is a lot of schools, in my opinion. I'm thinking, this is, this is very heavy lifting things that we're trying to do. But then when I look at this data, there is a clear disconnect in what we have been doing. 
especially with this population and with our African and brown kids. And when Mrs. Wolf asked about, you know, what are we looking at other areas? Because it's not like Montgomery County lacks funding. We have the funding. But I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to get to the bottom of it, where is the disconnect to be able to lift this, these, these children to, to a level where it, they're actually functional to be able to move on because that is our job. Whatever distractions are out there in the community, everything else is going on, our job are, is two, two things, fundamental. Math and reading readiness before they move on to sixth grade. So when I look at this, I want to cry. Because as Ms. Yen said, even in some of the other groups, we're not even there. I totally understand the pandemic and the effects on it, because I was, I was boots on the ground in the front center with a lot of these families and their challenges they had with everything else. But when I see a decrease, my heart stops. We should not, under any circumstances, in my opinion, be seeing a decrease in any of these groups. Point, point, fraction, point two, you know, even, in, even by moving in the right direction. So I implore you to look at other practices because whatever we are doing is not working. And to me, time is of essence. Whatever we, you know, because these kids are not going to be able to make it in middle school and high school. And they're not gonna, all this talk we have about readiness and you know, when they, they're not gonna be able to be able to do that. So I implore you, this is not working. And one of the things that I was looking at that you were, um, on, on how you're gonna assess the program, when, when I look at the increased inclusion opportunities for students, what does that mean? I, I, I want you to tell me what does that mean? Increase inclusion opportunities for students. I want to know exactly what that means. So what that means, that was specifically for students who receive special education services. And one of the state performance plan indicators that Montgomery County is measured by is the least restrictive environment. It is a part of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And we are required to educate a certain percentage, the state has set a benchmark of 71% of our students who receive special education services should be educated with their non-disabled peers in the general education setting 80% or more of the school day. MCPS has not met that mark, and so we are looking to increase when students demonstrate that they are ready, that they can have additional um, inclusive opportunities. Research has shown students who are included with their non in instruction, with their non-disabled peers, their achievement increases. As, but what the law says is that when we provide a free and appropriate public education, we have to make sure that we're meeting the needs that are outlined in that child's individual education program or their IEP. And so to increase inclusion, we want to make sure that we're providing opportunities to students with disabilities, that the teachers have the skills to build their capacity so that when the students are in their classrooms, they know how to implement the IEP as it's written. So how are they, um, how are they adapting that content? Do they know their students? Do they know the standards? What is the methodologies that they're going to use? And then how are they going to deliver it? And it doesn't just rely on our special education student, I mean teachers, we have to look at it from a holistic approach. And so when we look at increasing inclusion, we're trying to build professional learning that's based on high leverage practices that are research and evidence based. Hi, good afternoon, Tamara Hewlett. Um, thank you for your passion. That passion, um, I think, sure. is, is a shared passion. Um, and I think it's important how we tell the story of our emerging multilingual learners. So what you saw on the screen were the students who were currently in program. What you didn't see are the students who were, went through our English language development program, who are included in the end total of, of the non-tested students, who are outpacing our never EMLs. 
So I want us to ensure that we understand our English language development program is working. Our students are adding language, and when they're sitting in their content classes and they have enough English academic language, they are not only surpassing never uh, EMLs, but they are thriving and continuing uh, to gain in, in um, programs. So for example, um, I have some data here. The current fourth grade students who were currently EMLs um, for MCAP ELA, they were about a 20%. Our, our students who were in program and they exited by fourth grade, they were at a 75%. 75% of them met the target. So it, it, is, it is hard to look at the data on the screen for a fourth grader who may have come this year who do, they do not have adequate language development, they have not had enough services, they have not had enough time and program, ELD and content, to demonstrate proficiency. But they end up, they, they do, once they continue in the ELD program and once they continue to receive targeted instruction. And it takes everyone. Our content teachers have to see themselves as language development teachers and include those scaffolds during instruction of the content, not just during the 30 to 45 minute period that the English language development teacher has with them. So I just want to reframe um, and, 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 and leverage the passion and make sure we understand that there's another story. There's another story. And I, if I were an emergent multilingual learner and I saw that, I would think to myself, that's not me. And it's not. And I want to make sure that we all understand that our students who have been in ELD programming, they are achieving once they are at proficiency level four or above. They start to turn that, that, that needle. So we, we just need to, to continue to provide those services and make sure that we are looking at time and program, um, what's happening in the content, et cetera. In the Harris had her light on, but do you have follow-up? I just had a follow-up, not, not for the EML, but I understand what you're saying, but the African-American students can speak English, and their story is pitiful on that screen and, and really has me upset. I think what I'm not, I'm not sure is really happening is the differentiation of instruction. That, I think there's something missing there, and that's why I want to know, have you explored um, teaching around the country to see where it's successful for those students and see what we can do to enhance whatever we're doing to show improvement because they can already speak English. I appreciate that. And, and Montgomery County is over, outperforming the state here. And our state standards, I would say, are by far at high. We have been well known in Maryland for having a high expectation for outcomes, for high standards for our students. But that's what an I would say, good number. What I, that's an right. aggregate number. I'm still focused on the number for African American students. I understand what you're saying, and and I think what you're saying, and I agree, is that some of the work that we've been doing cross offices to reframe around the equitable teaching and learning framework, which we developed last year. It is just beginning, right? In response to the anti-racist audit in the action plan, one of the things is we need to be very consistent with how we're talking about instruction, what it means to differentiate, and how you do that for, for the experiences for different groups of children. There's a lot of intentional work being done right now about including the language acquisition strategies along the same time as the modeling or scaffolding strategies along the same time as the asset-based and affirming um, classrooms where the expectations are high for all students. Um, and there's work to be done around that. I don't disagree with you. But I don't know um, I, that I, we've given it a chance yet to really have the impact that it should be having on our students. I would challenge you to say the expectation is not high for all students, and that's part of the issue. Ms. Harris? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, um, a couple of questions. First, uh, looking at the um, special education, um, the dynamic learning maps, and one, um, I, I just was looking at this and thinking about 
um, some of our testimony today, especially from Ms. Fink, the um, self-contained as a special education teacher. And she had four common sense recommendations to help improve the work experience and workload of special education teachers in Montgomery County. And one of them is um, lessen special educators' workload by removing grading as a measurement for ALO students, given they are not diploma bound and have detailed quarterly progress reports. And I can't help but wonder if, if we took a common sense step like that, and I don't know exactly what the state mandates are, but we need some common sense infused in the MSDE requirements in a lot of our populations as well. But you know, giving those teachers that additional time to be with and work with their students on some of these skills that will be measured here could only help more students achieve the, the, the benchmarks that, that we hope that they'll achieve. I'm, I'm just making that as an observation from, you know, boots on the ground educator who knows what it's like and is in it every day. Um, uh, just as an observation. But I, and I did want to echo, I mean, I think we've been, since I came on the board in December 20, and I remember in January of 21 having a very direct conversation, and that so many faces have changed. But it was a, it was a very strong message that the way we have traditionally educated our emerging multilingual students, look back historically, year after year, decades, has, has failed them. And so we needed to change the way we approached that work. And I think, I think that we are. Um, and I think we had a presentation about a year ago in which I think the board was not pleased at what it was hearing around how we were transforming the work to support these students. Um, and so we're, we are changing that model. We are, we are coming up, we are benchmarking against systems who demonstrably do better than we do in serving those populations. And so hearing more about what we have brought in from those high performing dis systems, I think would, would, I would be very interested to see what have we, ha what have we taken from those who do very well in serving these populations. Because I, when I look at the numbers, one of the things that I observe is, so when we're looking at our fourth graders and our EML students that are identified in that group. And when you gave us the numbers, mm -hmm. so 25% of them are EML. So 25% of our students are in this group that is not meeting by any stretch the benchmark. And so when we crack that nut, 25% of our students, then we're getting somewhere. And so how, and, and it's, with the fifth graders, it's 20%. And so just, re, I'm really interested to see and have a better understanding of what we are now doing differently to support those EML students. Um, and I know we've had the, you know, talked about the co-teaching model, and so it wasn't just they had like an, an ESOL class once a day and then, boy, you're on your own in your rest of your content areas. But I'm really interested to hear more about what we are specifically doing. And I think I, what I was understanding Ms. Pugh saying earlier when we were talking about how are we measuring, because a lot of this is just being implemented. And I think what I was hearing mostly is that our, our key evaluative approach this year is looking at are we doing this with fidelity, school to school, are we doing what we are saying we want to do with our math coaches and our math content specialists and our reading specialists? Is that happening the way we want it to? And we're look, are we going classroom to classroom, seeing those look for's? And we're, we're focusing on that. But hopefully if we're seeing that, then the student outcomes will so what are we actually doing differently now with our, especially EML students, um, to really help them with the, they're getting that language while they're also getting content knowledge? And what does that look like in the, if I'm that ELD student, what does my day look like? What am I, what, what am I learning? How am I learning it? How am I being expected to learn it? And we, because we've seen great stuff, I think, this year. 
Good afternoon, President Silvestri, Dr. McKnight, and board members. Um, Diana Wells, Associate Superintendent for the Office of Special Education. And I wanted to come up and first say I've already contacted my team to set a meeting up with Ms. Fink to discuss her uh, four recommendations. But for that specific recommendation, um, I just wanted to clarify. Uh, Maryland law permits parents to consent to um, alternative learner outcomes. So we can't place a student on a certificate track. That is a parent's decision. So we have some parents that sometimes um, students may be younger and they may believe that the student is not able to do the grade level work or work in the content standards in, in those earlier grades, but may later dis determine after additional assessments um, and additional time in school that they should be working towards a diploma. And so we, we cannot have an ungraded student because as they, parents can decide to not consent or to consent to ALO at any time. And so that would be the challenge with, with that particular uh, recommendation. But for all the other ones, um, we welcome the opportunity to meet with Ms. Fink. She can go back up. Thanks. Okay. Oh, I have a follow-up. Yeah, I think there was another part of Ms. Oh. Uh, Harris's question about what we're doing differently with ELL this year. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so one concrete example that I can give you occurs when teachers are effectively planning for math instruction. And it's an outgrowth of the collaborative training that teams from every elementary school attended this summer. So how do you elevate the language demands in a lesson? What is the language a child needs to learn alongside the content that child needs to learn as the teacher is planning for mathematics or fill in the blank, science, social studies, English language arts. That is, a, that is a concrete action and an explicit action teachers have to take each day as they're preparing to teach. And so learning the strategies that they can use and the tools that are available to create a visual representation of, an, of an, a concept or an object in addition to just using the word in instruction. Um, providing the materials in English side by side with the child's um, first language so that the child can start to make the connections between how they've heard something said before and how we're bringing it forward in English keeps, with the grade level content, keeps the child learning the mathematics while they're learning the language at the same time. And these are strategies that teachers might not have always had an opportunity to engage in the learning around. There are English language development teachers in buildings. There are instructional specialists and coaches. But now, if you take the instructional math coaches, for example, that is one of the explicit conversations they're leading as they're sitting with their team and teaching them how to plan so that the teacher is elevating calling out, explicitly planning for a new math term, a new academic term in English that a child may or may not know, with strategies around things like um, total physical response. How do they see it and see a teacher acting it out at the same time as saying it? How do they see it uh, pictorially represented? Tools that are going to allow the child to be developing the language and developing the mathematics at the same time. And not every teacher had those tools in their toolbox to begin with. I can tell you that when I went through my undergraduate program in elementary education, I didn't learn how to do those things. But I'm learning them now. And my coaches are teaching their teachers how to do that now. Are we, just a follow-up question, are we looking at, as, as, a, as just a marker, um, data on students who are in a classroom with a teacher who is bilingual in their uh, in their uh, first language. Hi. <laughs> Just all around the table today. <laughs> um, no, we haven't actually taken a look at that. Um, uh, sp specifically around uh, teachers who language in a language that is majority of 
the students in the classroom outside of two-way immersion. So with two-way immersion, you know, you have some bilingual teachers, um, you have some monolingual teachers, but you also have some bilingual teachers. But it is something that we can try to work with HR with, because then we would have to identify who has recognized and, and um, identified themselves as bilingual. But first language is a strategy. Um, and as we think about the question about what does my day look like if I'm an emergent multilingual learner, you know, per our guidance, and I think I think what you, my, I think it was you, um, said in terms of the fidelity of implementation, right? So um, we cannot be in every building at every at all periods of day, but our guidance is um, to try to keep our students in their classrooms um, as much as possible. There is. There is um, disruption when you're you're out. You don't have the language. You've missed something. You walk into the room. Everybody's having a good time. What did I miss? I don't understand. I, like I don't understand because I don't language in English as much as I need to yet. And then I'm coming into this environment and trying to have to reacclimate. Um, yes, there is a space for newcomer work um, for a pullout, but we our guidance is more plug-in and co-teaching as much as possible. So uh, an, an emergent multilingual learner will have either an ELD teacher plugging in sometimes, um, but their primary provider is the content teacher. And so that's why we really have to get our content teachers on board and Based on um, the work that the elementary team did this summer, I know our schools are on board. They sense the urgency as well. Um, we trained just about every elementary school, their instructional leadership teams, and we are busy. Our, our, our small but mighty team is busy. We're getting a lot of calls for support, um, which we are, we are deploying as much as possible to teach our content teachers who, as Sheila identified, when, when we went through our programming, um, even now, when you look at uh, college programming, um, there is starting to, to be an uptick in um, coursework that addresses emergent multilingual learners, but colleges aren't there yet. So our, our teachers are learning, and we are doing as much as we can to build their capacity, um, because content teachers truly, that's where the students are. The students are in the content classes. And so we need to make sure we have comprehensible input, which involves gestures, it involves what you see, it involves how you make language visible for our students. Um, and uh, making sure that the students are guided along the way uh, and supported. And when, when the students don't need those supports anymore, you remove them gently and, and so that they can you know, have that productive struggle as well. Because I think one data point that I, I could be wrong, I, but I don't think I've ever seen. So as we observed earlier, some students are going to fit into many of these categories. Mm -hmm. But what I don't think we've ever seen is, for example, a breakdown. If we look at our, um, um, look at our Hispanic Latino students. But if we if we look at our Hispanic Latino students here, and then those who are EML and those who aren't. And then, so what are those differences? Same thing with our, Afri you know, with with our, um, you know, African American, Black African American students. When we look at them, but we don't ever look at we look at them as a category, but we don't ever look at them as the ones that are also EML and the ones that aren't EML, mm -hmm. to see if what's happening there, because um, I think I would find that I would find that in, because you've said once some of these students emerge. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not EML, they're ever EML. Mm -hmm. They're outperforming. But we're not seeing that data. Mm -hmm. So just an observation. Thank you. I'm going to ask my questions now since I haven't done um, <laughs> And I have three. And I'll ask, just ask them, and then you all can decide. Um, so you gave an example of where there are eight math coaches at the schools that needed the most. So you're differentiating resources. What's happening at? the many other schools that are not maybe the ones that needed it the most, but are still struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that math intervention look like? Mm -hmm. Two, uh, does your MCAP data mirror your MAP data? Are the, is it similar, or am I not understanding those two tests? And three, um, tutoring was the hot button intervention during the pandemic. Tutoring, tutoring, tutoring as a best practice. And we did a lot of tutoring. 
I think we learned some lessons about what type of tutoring worked best. Is tutoring happening at, say, these eight schools that you have identified as needing additional support? Okay, so I'll start with the first one. Um, we Not only does the elementary math team have our eight instructional math coaches, those are 10-month teacher-level positions. They work for us through the course of the school year um, with some summer days. They're not year-round. Um, they're not year-round. The traditional, the other traditional position that the curriculum team has are our instructional specialists. So the elementary math team now has five. You expanded us from three to five, thank you. So we have five instructional specialists who are 12 month, um, and they deploy to the rest of the school. So the eight coaches cover 33. I have one coach that has five schools and the rest of four. So 33 of the schools are covered by the instructional math coaches on that daily, that weekly work. They also have an instructional specialist assigned behind them if they need some school improvement planning support, broader professional development support, et cetera. But the five instructional specialists are focusing most of their attention on the other 100-ish schools. So they are deployed and they support the named math leader in every elementary building. There is an identified person. Often it is the staff development teacher because most schools don't have dedicated staffing just for math like reading. So the staff development teacher is the named math leader in many of our buildings. Some schools, some of our Title I schools are able to use a focused teacher position to name a math leader. So every school has someone on the ground in the building who supports math for their grade level teams. And our instructional specialists are their first direct point of contact. So every school has somebody on the elementary math team that is their direct point of contact. Those elementary math leaders across the whole district, they receive training about five times a year. We bring them all together for system-wide training. And then in between, the instructional specialists are out in the schools, similar to the coaches, but not with the level of intensity, um, providing support for how those math leaders are um, bringing forward the learning of the district. Thank you. So that's the first question. There's more, but that's the, that's the gist. Um, so that's the first question. The second one was MAP and MCAP. According to Dr. Keisha Addison, there is an alignment between MCAP and MAP. Um, and so what you should see is, although they're different and they're assessing different things, um, her report did show a, a strong correlation. Okay, thank you. Uh, the third question, tutoring. So tutoring, what we learned about what works well, also based on evaluation, is high intensity tutoring that occurs in the school. Uh, a minimum of three times a week for 30 minutes at a time by the same person. And so what we have done um, to, to help that is use the existing people that we have in schools currently in terms of paraprofessionals to give them more training to be able to deliver high intensity tutoring, basically interventions in school, because that's what we found is when we can, when we have access to all of the students and can organize their day such that their supports are given during the day specific to that student's needs, um, then we're meeting their needs without having to have transportation, without having to burden families, but it's built into their day and every school has interventions through a multi-tiered system of support built into their school day. So not tutoring, but learning supports built into the school day. Okay. Ms. Yang? Yes, hi, thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about, because we're talking about instruction, I want to touch upon the question about technology use in our classrooms. Um, um, in the past few years, we have invested a lot in technology uh, in our schools. And a um, bigger portion of the students' days are now uh, using technology compared to before. Um, um, we have heard from uh, community advocates and certainly um, MCCPTA Safe Technology Com Committee about uh, the concern for screen time. And I also have read um, many articles on publication from National Education Association dis discussing the different reading outcomes when students are engaging with books versus students are reading things on computers. Different reading patterns, different uh, concentration level, attention span. 
And I just want to have an understanding. Uh, I, we, I also read about uh, pen as a memory tool uh, to facilitate uh, memorization of internalization of material. So I want to hear about your approach of using technology and your instruction or direction to our teachers who are mostly millennials who believe in using technology. So how is that helping or maybe at times we need to really have them hold a book, engage, ponder. So um, it's an open-ended question. So from the mathematics perspective, there's very little screen time. Mathematics is visual. It's tactile. They're doing it on pencil paper. They're using manipulatives. They're in groups having discussions. There are instructional language routines they're using. So they're, they're talking. Occasionally, there's an image up for the whole class to use. But the only screen time in mathematics would happen twice. There's a few exceptions if you're enrolled in the Montgomery Virtual Academy for an accelerated course, which is a different experience. However, um, in the day-to-day -day mathematics, the pre-module diagnostics that are on our equip platform, the really short um, before the unit assessment that teachers can give children to give them some data ahead of the teaching, that is a digital platform. So the kids answer in there, okay? The only other time they're on a screen typically in math, in grades uh, three, four, and five, their mid-module and end-of-module assessment is on the Performance Matters platform. Everything else in mathematics doesn't involve a screen. It's not technologically based. Just to add to that, I just wanted to say a couple things about what we're doing with technology. First of all, we do view technology as a tool to enhance the instructional environment, like your pencil's a tool, like your paper's a tool. Technology is also a tool, but it doesn't replace good and sound teaching practices. Right? So we do strike a balance, and one of the things that Dr. Pugh and I have both been working on with the MCCPTA Safe Tech Group is we have been working on um, a digital balance guide for staff um, and for students and for parents around how to strike that balance. But I think what we always also have to remember is that we also are, it's, it's our obligation to make sure that we're preparing these kids for college. When they're in college, they are gonna be in front of a screen. They are gonna have to assess. So we do have to be very careful to balance making sure that we have different types of instructional resources and tools that we're using with preparing our students for a very different world than what we were launched into when we were in school. Um, I appreciate the answer. Uh, with our youngest learners, uh, we, we do want to really look at the balance, uh, the health of their eyes. Um, so uh, a lot of things to consider, uh, but I, I just want to bring that to our attention. And our final question, Ms. Rivera. Um, just wanted to follow up on uh, my colleague's point about the breakdown of, um, like, looking at the Latino population and breaking it down, the African American, so on. But I want to go a step further than that with the EML students, because something that um, that she said of that you might have a fourth grader who had interrupted education. So in my mind, there is also different levels of EML students. And I think that's also really important to look at and to break it down. There's a difference, I think, of an EML student who was born at Shady Grove Hospital versus an EML student who just moved to the country, right? So looking at, and my other thing is being very, deliberate and intentional about getting these numbers better. I'm already thinking ahead to summer and summer school, because I know summer school this past year was by invitation or somehow of invitation only. To me, when you look at these numbers, these kids who are struggling in this area should automatically be invited to summer school. It just kind of makes sense that we keep that instruction going. And I don't know how that plays into your program of the summer, you know, coaches or math coaches and so on. And also for the office, you know, for the EML learners office, I think it'd be really good to know if 
that the staff that you have right now is sufficient to be able to answer the needs of this very complex sometimes population because I you know um, by looking at the numbers it's not a minute number and if your team is not big enough to answer that, then what we're doing is we're overburdening you, right? And I think that's the last thing we want to do as a system. I think we want to have all the tools. But I really would like to know if there's a, um, there's a plan to continue this through um, summer school. So summer school is currently being planned, and it is definitely based on those students who need it need it most um, in, that, uh, in that order in our focus groups. Um, and we'll be bringing forward a plan for summer school that will be com comprehensive and show all of them. Um, I also, you know, appreciate what you're saying about really truly understanding who who is represented in that number of EML, because we do have the access level data, which does tell us their level of like language acquisition, mm -hmm. and so. That group, if they're still in services and they're coded as EML, are going to be lower in their uh, level of acquisition anyway, right? Am I saying that correctly? <laughs> yeah, so I, I would expect to see different outcomes from an ELP4 than an ELP1, English language proficiency level student. Um, uh, you know, a, a level one uh, marker just says you, you are entering uh, in adding English to your linguistic repertoire, you know, um, and you could be new to the country or you could have been born here and just been in an, have been in an environment where another language was used more. All of our students come to us with a lot of language, right? It's just not the language of power or the language of instruction for most students. And so what we are doing is ensuring that they, we are building them up to having that English um, language. Uh, and, and our team really says, but, but not at the cost of your first language. So uh, we want to make sure you understand that we want the child, we want our children to be whole, um, to keep their first language, because research shows the stronger you are in your L1, your first language, the faster it is to add that English to your linguistic repertoire. Um, and so um, there, there is a difference um, between an assessment that is language heavy, and you are expected to take it in English, um, if you do not understand what it is that you're reading and you have to assess because you don't have enough English yet, chances are your outcomes are going to look a little different. It does not mean that the student is void of success. Um, and so, yes, I mean, the, the stories are nuanced for every single emergent multilingual learner we have. Um, and I think we can definitely work on, on telling a, a more robust story for our students. Dr. Yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Silvestri. So I've just been listening and engaging in the discussion. And I think it may have been a meeting or two ago, Ms. Rivera, of, and you actually asked about um, are students ever able to be assessed in the language that they speak. And I think you were getting at that very point. And the, the, the focus is absolutely, we know these students are bringing to the table um, much um, mastery in skills. It is then unable to communicate that mastery in the English language. And so, you know, that is, I've, I've been listening and I, you know, just thinking about how locally we can look at that. I absolutely am open to that. We just know that we're always gonna be up against the challenge of when we present this data according to the state's requirements, it's, it's asking us to do that. So I just wanted to add that in because I remembered your question at the last board meeting. It was getting at that very thing. And so that's why we have to continue to show our students the value that they do bring to the table. And as we, you know, we have these conversations and we want to continue to, continue to emphasize to them, we know you have the skills. We know that you are um, prepared. And if you aren't, we are, we're expected to do the things to actually help you be prepared. But for our lang English language learners specifically, I just want to put out that that's a challenge. And we, we have to continue to validate them in ways, knowing that they're vulnerable and others may question what they know and how much they know. But the question really is when it's expected to be expressed in the English language. Ms. Wolf. Yeah, um, I, I heard you say the, the language a child needs to learn for math 
And it occurs to me, and I've only observed third and fourth grade math recently, <laughs> that the language is times tables. And I'm wondering if we should start thinking about being able to give a set of flashcards to every third grade student, every fourth grade student, because a lot of that math is building on them knowing the times tables. And I know there are many of us that can afford it, but there are many who can't afford flashcards. And I just think it's something we need to think about because in my day, and I know that was many years ago, you had to memorize it, not do what Eureka <laughs> says and, and figure it out various ways. You memorized it, but I think that helped. Thank you for that recommendation, Ms. Wolf. That's great. And I'll add place value onto that too because that's the other foundation between timetables and, and place value. If those two are not mastered, it is extremely difficult for you to build any mathematics uh, skills on that. So as we go into these discussions and we go into talking about our budget coming up, I think you know in this conversation there have been many things expressed around what are the resources that are needed. So I think it's appropriate for us to come back and really talk about this and remind ourselves of this conversation and think about, you know, what do we need in terms of people and what do we want to give to our students that we don't want to leave up to families to purchase that can help them outside the of the classroom. To purchase. Or the teachers. Yes, um, so resources that we need and also how effectively we are using our existing resources because resources are limited. So um, as people have noticed, we're doing a data progress monitoring presentation at every single meeting because this is our mission teaching and learning and academic achievement. And we, everybody here in this room wants our children to thrive and to increase. We are better than many in the state, but we, we, we have high expectations for ourselves and we can all agree that we want uh, our children to achieve at the highest levels. So thank you so much for the presentation. Keep up the good work and uh, we hope to see even better news next time. Thank you. We will now proceed with our next agenda item, which is annual legislative priorities, and I will ask uh, Ms. Arpschrank to come to the table. Good afternoon, edging on evening. President Silvestri, Dr. McKnight, members of the board. I am here today to present the board's proposed legislative platform for the 2024 legislative session. At the conclusion of what I think will be a brief discussion, I'm going to ask you to approve the priorities after which we can begin to collaborate on, discuss bills with our delegation um, that will hopefully benefit MCPS students and employees. Uh, you'll notice that the Legislative priorities are in the same format as last year. Uh, there are three big buckets that come from your strategic plan. And then within that, each bucket, there are um, a handful of smaller items uh, that are items of interest. Some of these specific priorities were carried over from last year, and some have been updated uh, to align the board's legislative priorities to your priorities for the 23-24 school year and MCPS's strategic plan. There have been there were additional updates um, in light of the adopted position the board took on some legislation last year. Um, so the, the priorities as they stand would reflect the board's positions um, on legislation that comes before the General Assembly during the 24 um, legislative session. As always, we focus a lot on um, funding and local autonomy. That's a concern for this board as well as all boards in, in the 24 school systems. Um, and then we've added a, a little more on workforce de development and student well-being as those were items that were of interest last year. Adopting this platform will allow the board to be more present and active in Annapolis and advocate for our school system, our students, and hopefully for the betterment of school systems across the state. So at uh, this point, I would be happy to answer any questions you have related to the legislative priorities or the board's platform. Um, after any questions are answered, I would ask you to approve the priorities so that we can get going with our work. And we need a motion for that? Correct. Questions, comments? 
Seeing Sevens. That. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those present. Thank you, Ms. Officer. Thank you. Okay, our next agenda item is number eight, consent items. And I will ask my colleagues to please turn on their lights to see if they want to pull any items. Ms. Harris. Uh, yes, item 8.1, item 8.2, and item 8.4. <coughs> Anything else? If not, can I get a motion to move the rest in block? Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those present. Okay, if we could begin with item 8.1. Yes, thank you. Um, and there are two items I just wanted to pull out of that uh, document to highlight around, the, which has been a very hot topic this week, the sustainability work that the system's doing. Uh, and the first is the first item on the, that in that memorandum, uh, which is around our contract for our energy savings performance work. And uh, the work, this was presented in some depth at our September 19th uh, Fiscal Management Committee meeting, but I um, would just ask for the greater wider world if we could just get a quick little overview of what exactly that work is doing for the system. Sure, and I'll ask uh, Mr. Adams to come down and talk a little bit about those uh, contracts and the work that we're doing there. Um, and as you noted, we did have a presentation a few board uh, meetings ago where we went over some of that, but Seth can... Uh, offer additional details. Sure, so the uh, this is an exciting contract. This is one that's been in the, in the works for a while. Um, you know, it's probably before the uh, the policy was passed, but really this work is around um, evaluating all of our buildings, uh, doing an investment grade audit, uh, essentially looking at where we can see improvements. And the, the improvements basically would be funded based on energy savings through this contract. So, you know, we're, we're evaluating each facility. We're looking for sort of the low-hanging fruit. So we're looking for some of the infrastructure that we can possibly take advantage of replacing. Um, and essentially, we will pay for this through the energy savings achieved through it. So that's why it's called an energy savings performance contract. Um, we're, we're, we're starting with about 100 schools first, you know, the schools that were identified as, as some of our largest um, energy users, and then we obviously move forward. So even the testimony today around um, light pollution and, and going from incandescents to LEDs, all of that work, you know, we're hopeful is going to be encompassed in this, and it will be very um, minimally impactful to our overall CIP uh, because of how it's structured, um, you know, in terms of utilizing energy savings to fund this work. And I think we mentioned it briefly, but I think this is a great area of work for our Student Climate Action Council and our climate ambassadors to both promote the work so more people and more of their students who all suffer, or many of whom suffer from a great deal of climate anxiety, are aware of what we're doing as a system, but also how they can be part of the work. So bringing them in, and I believe Mr. Mazzaferro from N5V um, is going to be meeting with them um, in the next month. So thank you for that. And then the other uh, other thing I just did want to pull out was that in the same consent item um, is uh, an item for uh, purchase and installation of seven electric vehicle charging stations, and um, that is not for our bus fleet. So, yeah. Sure. As part of our you know sustainability team, you know, and part of our maintenance teams, we're always looking for opportunities, even with replacement of vans or, or, or trucks or, or vehicles that are part of our, of our rural fleet. We are moving in a direction of uh, where we're available to you know, purchase electric vehicles. And we have gone down that, that path. And this is the work, the infrastructure that's going to support that. So charging stations to support our vehicles that are on the road every day, um, supporting our schools and, and students. So you know, continue to work beyond just school buses, but to work with, within the overall operations uh, to, to look to electrify our fleet. Yeah, and I just have to say, I, when I looked at the overall dollar amount on that item, I thought all I could think was money well spent. Yeah, so, thank you. That was 8.1, now 8.2. Yes, the um, contract for, I think it's $14 million for 90 um, special education diesel buses, I think 60 wheelchair Bus it, that are wheelchair usable, uh, and then 30 which which don't, and we've all seen a lot of public interest in this item. So, explaining why a diesel purchase 
Yep, wonderful. Thank you. And I'll ask um, Ms. Edwards and Mr. Lewis, our director, uh, acting director of transportation, to come down and join us as well. Um, and while they're making their way down, I just want to say, um, you know, we are very invested in uh, electrifying our bus fleet. We are the leader across the nation. We remain the leader uh, with the largest electric bus fleet in the country. We want to continue working in that direction. Uh, we've made that commitment, and um, nothing about this particular purchase changes any of that. Um, we want to have electric buses. Uh, I have two kids of my own who are very interested in this, and I bring your uh, child to work day. I actually took him out to one of the depots, and they saw one of the electric vehicles, and my 10-year-old thought it was about the coolest thing he'd ever seen. And so uh, our students want it. Our community wants it. Uh, we do want uh, electric buses, but we need to have buses on the road to make sure that we're getting students to school every single day. And so a few of the challenges that we um, and I guess I'll also just point out that we are looking at other ways in addition to uh, the electric buses that we can lower our uh, environmental impact. And so Mr. Adams was just talking about some of the other vehicles that we're um, uh, electrifying. We are also looking at uh, routes and making sure that our routes are as efficient as possible so the buses are on the road for as short of a distance and time as possible. We're also looking at uh, a fleet mix and can are there uh, opportunities to use vans or smaller or other uh, types of buses if the bus the large buses aren't completely full. So we continue um, to move in that direction. We have run into a few uh, challenges with uh, the current uh, electric bus contract that we are uh, currently engaged in. Um, one of the big ones has been delivery times and delivery dates, and uh, the buses just simply have not arrived uh, on time and when we were told that they would arrive. So we were supposed to receive 120 uh, school buses before school started this year. Uh, to date, we have only received 43 obviously well into the school year at this point. Uh, in addition to that, of the 43, only a handful uh, are actually on the road because once we receive the buses, we have to go through the registration process with the state of Maryland. We need to uh, fit them with uh, radios and cameras. And so all of that takes time after we receive the buses. So there's only a handful on the road right now. Um, which has forced us to uh, extend the life of some of our buses. So normally a bus has a 12-year life cycle. Uh, we've had to extend several of our buses by two years, um, which is not an ideal state. Obviously, they're older buses. They break down more often. They're less efficient. Um, but that's the position that we have kind of been boxed into. And the reality is you can only, the state only allows you to extend those for th a total of three years. And so, like I said, we're on year two of many of these buses. And so we are really uh, at a point where our backs are against the wall uh, with our fleet. The other challenge is uh, our fleet mix. So we know that we need special education buses. Um, over the past several years, uh, as we have purchased EV buses and the special ed buses are not yet available, um, we have over uh, purchased full-size buses and we are uh, well under where we need to be with the special education buses. And so this purchase, although it won't get us completely caught up, it moves us in the right direction uh, of the fleet mix that we need to serve uh, our students. Um, you know, one other issue that, we, that we're seeing is we kind of work through these first couple years of uh, implementation uh, and putting these buses on the road are, you know, mechanical issues. And any bus can have mechanical issues. The challenge with the EVs is that uh, oftentimes they're uh, new challenges uh, that, you know, our uh, technicians haven't seen before. And so they're addressing new challenges. Uh, there are often supply chain issues with, with these parts, these higher, newer technology parts. Um, and so that uh, creates challenges. We often see a bus, an electric bus, if it goes down, at any given time, we have about 10% uh, of our electric bus fleet down, which is significant. Um, and they can be down for as much as three to six months uh, because of some of the supply chain issues that I mentioned. And so anytime you're on the cutting edge, the precipice of a new technology like this, there are going to be challenges. And so as I stated, you know, we are <laughs> fully committed to moving ahead with the electrification of our bus fleet, uh, but need to do so in a way that does not threaten the operational excellence that we need to see in our Department of Transportation. So again, um, the biggest challenge is being that we just are not receiving the buses on the dates that they are promised, and that is stretching our fleet and uh, putting us potentially at risk in future years. And could you address um, 
you know, we all saw the uh, Parents Coalition message, and they included a blog post in there that, and I am paraphrasing, I acknowledge that, that basically said, you could go to Bluebird right now, and they would drive electric, you know, special education buses onto your lot. So could we just address that claim or that, that assertion for the wider world? Sure. Um, so we buy our buses from Thomas Built Buses. Um, we uh, have one type of buses, and that's Thomas. Uh, the reason for that is that um, if we had more, if we were to purchase uh, the you know another type of bus, then we would need to stock twice as many parts. Um, our technicians would need to learn to repair uh, two different types of buses, and so school districts around the country uh, generally have one type of bus that they use, uh, and that's the the type that they stock parts for and that their uh, people are trained to, to fix and repair. And I don't know if um, Mr. Lewis has anything to add to that. Sure. Sure. Thank you for the opportunity and good afternoon, President Silvestri, Dr. McKnight, other members of the Board of Education. I also want to underscore very quickly uh, Mr. Hull's um, awareness and also his advocacy on our behalf as transportation. We, as an entire department, want to continue our work for sustainable efforts for being environmentally friendly and conscious around pupil transportation. And still in the state of Maryland, Montgomery County continues to lead the efforts in the school bus industry across all of our other districts. So I just wanted to underscore that. I also want to say thank you to all the amazing drivers and attendants out there for the hard work that they put forward. But to go back to um, part of the special education bus piece, so working with our vendor right now, we actually um, requested special education buses. Ten of our order of 120 for this school year will be a type A special education bus with a wheelchair lift for our special needs students. So while we embark on the journey to incorporate this new vehicle type into our fleet, we don't yet have any data around the performance, about their ability to successfully serve our students to meet the, the needs of Montgomery County um, students to support their access to education. So we're still in the learning curve about introducing new vehicle types as electric buses into our fleet. Second to that, as Mr. Hull previously um, stated, introducing a new manufacturer or any vehicle type that's different than what we have could pose potential operational challenges for us, particularly with the space um, challenges that we have at all five of our depot footprints, although we have seven operational depots. We only have five um, places that we stock parts for the buses. It would also require, again, our maintenance technicians and our fleet auto service workers to embark on another journey to learn and then be able to be certified under um, a different type of vehicle, and then presumably we, we may have to use another vendor or however the procurement pieces would come into play for an introduction of another um, manufacturer to our fleet. So as a combination of all those challenges, I can't operate in a gray area. I want to be able to wake up every morning with certainty that the vehicles that we have support the 102,000 students that deserve and are eligible for our bus transportation. Thank you. And um, just. This may be, um, okay, I'm not an expert in procurement, but I know the contract is for 90 buses, which when we were discussing earlier, these would not be to be delivered today. They would be for delivery over the summer. And is there a way that we could um, express some kind of preference with Thomas? I don't know what their supply chain is around these these type buses, but if, if they could, would we have the flexibility in the contract to um, modify the number of diesel buses to um, so that some of them could be electric buses if that supply chain materializes in the time frame in which we need to have these buses? Um, unfortunately not, because we'll be going through a different uh, supplier um, to get those buses, uh, a supplier that doesn't. Um, so Thomas builds the buses, and then um, the supplier uh, kind of retrofits them or uh, makes them into the electric buses. And so we'd be going through a different company that, that does not provide that type of a service. But again, uh, you know, we purchase buses every single year. And so hopefully uh, a year from now, uh, we're sitting back here talking about uh, the 120 electric buses that we're ordering for the following year. So just because we're needing to make a shift uh, at this particular moment does not signal in any way uh, a long-term strategy shift uh, for the district. And the last point I'll, I'll last comment I'll make is I, I am, I do appreciate this. You know how much I appreciate this work. I am concerned about the prospect of bringing 90 new diesel buses into the fleet and maintaining them in the fleet for 12 years, which I know is the lifespan of a bus, 
as under M uh, MSD state guidelines for public schools. Um, and so I would just like to ask very, that we be very intentional about potentially looking at ways to take those buses off the road earlier than 12 years if we can, because to me, for me, even if that would cost us a little more, I would, and I think the, the greater, a lot of folks in the greater wider world would rather see us, you know, really, really reduce that carbon footprint as expeditiously as we can. So just a comment. Yeah, and this is just a question just so, you know, the public can be aware. Are you looking into other uh, providers of electric buses other than the one we have now, seeing as they've been very inconsistent? Yes, we are. We will be putting out an RFP, um, and, of course, our, our current uh, partner will uh, be asked to uh, put in a bid on that, but others will be welcome to as well. Ms. Yang. Okay. Um, yes, hi. Good afternoon. Um, I share... Um, uh, the concern Ms. Harris just um, uh, uh, just uh, stated. Um, my question is, the supply chain issue, is that only impacting electric buses? That's not impacting diesel buses? So what is the delivery day of these diesel buses that we are ordering, or considering ordering? Yep. So um, the the delays are across the board. Um, so we would be looking at receiving these buses uh, after the beginning of next school year. Um, so they've, we've talked to Thomas directly. They've been very upfront about the fact that, you know, they would not be here at the beginning of next school year. But one thing that we have uh, learned, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have learned through this process is we don't know uh, now when the buses in 2024 are going to be delivered. All we have are, you know, estimates and promises. And so um, for us to, you know, put all of our eggs in one basket that uh, we, you know, have seen repeatedly not meet the deadlines that we need. So, for example, even last year um, in the 22-23 school year, we ordered, we had 61 buses. Um, none of them arrived before school started. Uh, the majority did arrive last year in August and September. Uh, that is not the case this year. So we're actually kind of moving in the in the wrong direction as far as getting these buses delivered on time. Um, and as we look at some of the delivery dates uh, for this current year, uh, you know, just for example, there were three that were supposed to be delivered on July 31st. Uh, we only got two, and it wasn't until August 18th. 16 were supposed to be delivered on August 7th. We only received two, and not until August 22nd. There were supposed to be 20 delivered on August 14th. We only received seven, and not until September 5th. And the list goes on here. So it is a, a consistent pattern of the buses not arriving on time. And so at this point, uh, to, you know, kind of blindly throw out the hope that uh, this is all going to turn around and the buses are going to be delivered next time, given this track record, is not something uh, that myself or the Department of Transportation is comfortable with. Mr. R, just to clarify, you listed a lot of delayed days. Are those the electric bus delayed days? Correct. Okay. Okay. So so we don't, we don't have the track record of the diesel bus, but we have the track record of delivery of the electric bus at this moment. So I can let uh, Mr. Lewis talk about, we have a, a long track record with diesel buses, and he can talk more about that. Uh, great question. So of the 2022 um, diesel order that we submitted for 64 buses, 50 of which were special education units, we received those all before the first day of school. And from my recollection, and it's been a long six weeks, all were on the road for the first day of school. Uh, I think um, that's important information uh, for our consideration because we do want to be able to service mm -hmm. our special education students. Um, then um, my next question will be, now we have a contract with our electric bus company, right? Highland, yep. that's the company. When we enter into this bus contract with a diesel company, would it impact that contract? So um, it would 
impact the contract as far as the number of buses that we are purchasing. Mm -hmm. It would not um, end that contract. We are still ordering 30 buses through that current contract for next year. So, and you know, the way that the electric buses work is we don't actually own the buses, we're leasing them. And so um, we're gonna be in this partnership uh, for at least the next 12 years and hopefully much longer as we kind of get this program back on track. Okay, thank you. And I, I share uh, my colleagues' concern um, that uh, I, I want us, uh, I know we are committed to, but if we can, uh, use electric buses, we will want to, by all means, try electric Absolutely. buses. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Hall, currently, you said we have, right now, uh, an amount of electrical buses that have not yet been registered or tagged, or how many, how many do, do we have of those? <coughs> So of our 120 for this year's deployment, we have less than half a dozen that are on the road right now. So there's three factors that go into their ability to be um, placed on the road with students. The first is they need to be registered and tagged. And so that's no longer a challenge. We're getting those tags completed on all of our buses that we receive. The second is the outfitting of our bus camera systems, both the internal and external camera systems, obviously very important for safety um, of our students and the motoring public. And then the third is the two-way radios so that each bus operator is able to quickly communicate at a moment's notice with one of our seven dispatch locations. And, and how long does that take to do? So the registration, pretty much in within a week or so, to my knowledge, which is fantastic. The bus cameras, our vendor, uh, Bus Patrol America, comes basically on an as-needed basis. We let them know that this batch of buses are in. They work weekends for us to make sure that they're retrofitted with the equipment we need. But the two-way radios remain a challenge for us. Um, there's supply chain issues um, where we do not have enough two-way radios to outfit all of these 120 buses for this school year. It and that would be the case with diesel buses, the two-way radios, or they already come with that? So we would place the order in advance with the two-way radios, which has been the practice. But for whatever reason, for this year, it was missed. So for next... Who, who, who missed that? Us or Highland? So that would be under the, the order with the dealer. The dealer missed... Correct. ...to place the order for the two-way radio. That is correct. Okay. So now there's a supply issue with those. That is correct. So even if we got the tags done and even if we had the cameras done you still could not put those the rest of the buses in circulation until you had the cameras done the two-way radios the correct two, um, the two-way radios yes. which is essential 100 percent. okay um but then my question again is so how many do we have sitting there right now not being able to circulate i know we have 12 in circulation but how many do we have just sitting there so we have 43, um, the last I counted, and so that would leave about 30, a little over 30 that are still sitting on our Okay, our so depot. we currently physically have them, 30. Correct. So how long would it be for us to get the two-way radios? Do we have an idea? So we're working directly with Procom, our vendor, for the two-way radio systems, and unfortunately they are not able to give us a good or a solid estimate on when those units would be provided. Okay, so now let's fast forward to the diesel purchase. Okay. So if you were to purchase the diesel buses today, they're not going to be ready till when? Like when with delivery, you said they're not going to be ready till next summer. No, no, it'd be next uh, fall or next winter. Okay, so we are in a mess anyway, because, right? Because even if we got this, because I'm, I'm assuming it's not going to take, hopefully, it's not going to take um, a year to get uh, the two radios installed, hopefully. But even because the buses that you are ordering, the 90 buses, they will have to be, you know, you will have to have the radios, you will have to have the cameras, but that's already also not available to them. The, the two-way radios are not available to the diesel anyway. I, I, I think one of the things that was different was that the buses were, did not come with the radios. You would ask, where was the gap in there? Mm -hmm. In ordering these, we will make sure that the buses come with the radios to ask. That's one of the different components. We come at this time. It's not what we want to do, but it takes almost a year to build a bus. And with the size fleet that we have, like Mr. Hall says, in terms of just the turnover for every year, we take that into account. The past two years we've come, we've requested for an extension. And so, you know, with the diesel buses, yes, we will need the cameras. That will happen after 
they arrived to us. But in terms of the radios, we see that that was a missing component that was not happening, as Mr. Uh, Lewis said. That was through the actual manufacturer that did that, and that was a missed part that we definitely will take care of. I guess my concern is that we're going to have, either way, because what I, I heard, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Hall, through the grapevine, that there there is issues with parts anyway, either whether it's for the uh, for the electric buses or the diesel buses, they're having the same issue with the same, same similar parts. So my thing is, are we going to be in the same... <laughs> In the, in the same place next year, having a conversation where we're going to be like, well, now we haven't gotten the diesel buses, and we're going to be like, but now the, the, the electrical vehicles are ready. So what happens to, because I think then we have a contract to add an additional 100 buses through Highland for next year. So yes. does that, so, uh, so to the question of my colleague, of uh, Ms. Yang, so we will reduce our purchase of those buses. So we, I'm trying to understand the mechanics of it. No pun intended. So for next year, we're going to order um, 30 electric buses and then 90 of the diesel sped buses. Um, and so we will, because they're not going to be ready for the beginning of the school year, <laughs> we will have to, again, extend the life of our buses. But like I said, we can only do that for one more year. And so the further we get down this road, if we continue to um, invest only in one type of bus from one company, uh, we elevate our risk. Um, whereas, you know, by diversifying um, with, you know, two different orders for next year, that increases the chance that you know, we'll have the buses. I mean, we're going to have the buses we need because we can extend the life of the ones that we currently have. But we don't want to be in a position 12 months from now where another load of buses is delayed and then we can't extend it further. And so the, the further we get down this road, um, the more challenging it's going to be if we're not able to get in the buses uh, that we are ordering. If there's no other questions on this topic, we can move on to the next uh, consent Ms. item. Ms. Sylvester, I did want to yes. make a comment. I thought I saw Mr. Beasley in the room. Yes. Yes. Mr. Beasley, you don't have to come down. I just wanted to acknowledge him. He's one of our depot managers. And when I saw him come in the room, I was like, they care so much about this topic. And I know that his depot was one of the ones that started. Yeah. His depot was one of the ones that started and, and were the champions for trying the electric buses. And there were no, many of our bus drivers who were afraid to do that and were concerned about things. But he was a champion for it, and his depot did it. So I just wanted to – I saw you in the room. I, I thought I saw you on this side, but I'm so glad you're here. And thank you for caring so much to be here for this discussion today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. I think our last consent item is 8.4. Yeah, and I think Ms. Revere Oven has a question about this one too, but mine is just wondering if this um, contract has anything to do or partially addresses the, um, the advocacy we've heard from the Loiterman community about the special um, technical ma needs they have for maintaining and operating the very nice, very expensive equipment in their, uh, their middle school performing arts center. Yep, and so I'm going to ask Mr. Adams to come down again, and uh, he can provide more detail on the on the topic. So, so just to clarify this this item is for pretty much all schools, uh, most mostly high schools, and obviously schools like Woodman, but it is involve it involves um, inspection of set design, inspection of rigging, lighting. Uh, every every year when a, um, a school puts together a new performance, they develop a set that has to be inspected to make sure it's safe for students to be engaged in that. This is not uh, technical work around AV equipment or, or any of this. this is really just around structural uh, architecture associated with, um, you know, plays and other performances that happen to schools and any of the, the sets that are constructed or rigging that's involved in, in that process. Okay. Thank you. Mr. And, and and I had a nice conversation with Mr. Hall too about, um, and I'm glad to hear that it's going to be able to affect the other schools because there's a lot of schools that have very old equipment and they do magic with it, um, and 
is such an important part of it because that kind of program keeps a lot of kids busy after school. Theatricals and all that keeps, and it's a great program for kids to develop empowerment and self-empowerment. So I'm really glad that that's happening. But when we get these new equipment, can we not make it so cumbersome that the regular person cannot be able to um, to work on it? Like I, I, I did the Rocky Head lights for one of our shows because um, somebody had an accident on the way to the show and nobody wanted to be brave enough. It, it wasn't that bad, you know, you, you time it. But some of these consoles and like you have to go to to school or get a degree in. So I'm just, if we can just be conversant that there's, you know, um, that there's a lot of folks who, who just don't have those kind of skills too. So we want to make it, you know, better, not harder, I guess is trying to say. And that's a great point. We, we've actually partnered with MC, MCPS TV to standardize, you know, to better standardize what goes into our schools. Um, obviously every project is, uh, involves engagement and, and our, our, our theater teams are probably the most engaged when it comes to you know demanding the best for for um, their students, uh, but sometimes that does get a little bit complicated and it becomes very challenging. So yes, we've recognized that as a as an issue, and we're working with you know obviously folks like MC, MCPS TV and others to make sure we we provide state of the art, but something that's functional regardless of uh, who is there operating it. So it's a great point and one that we have recognized as as important. Very good. So now, uh, could I get a motion to move 8.1, 8.2, and 8.4 in block? Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous with those present. Okay, now we move to item number nine, which is for informational purposes only. Item 10, can I get a motion to move 10.1 through sorry. 10? I'm sorry, I did put also 8.6, I pulled out. Yeah. Could you follow up with staff after sure. the meeting? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, could I get a motion to move 10.1 through 10.3 in block? Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous with those present. 10.4, board members, does anyone have any new business item to bring up? Seeing none, um, can I get a motion to move 10.4? Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous with those present. Item 11 is for informational purposes only. And now, uh, could I get a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous with those present. We are adjourned.